good evening ladies and gentlemen and uh, hope you're all safe and sound welcome to the 8th nsc nyu conference for the indian financial market 2020 today is uh, day 1 of uh, a three day virtual conference we start our program today with a welcome address by vikram limai our uh, managing director and ceo of the national stock exchange and introductory remarks by professor us john of the nyu stern school of business we have two paper presentations each day the first paper presentation today is the effect of conflict on lending evidence from the indian border area by mrinal mishra from the university of zurich the second paper presentation today is uh, on financial literacy of women in india and the development of its capital markets by professor dennis philip from durham university uh, business school on day 2 tomorrow that is we have a panel discussion on uh, the road map to a vibrant corporate bond market i'm sure we are all looking forward to the panel discussion there we'll have professor viral acharya ex deputy governor of the reserve bank and uh, uh, professor at the nyu stern school of business we'll have professor tarun ramadurai professor of financial economics imperial college london we'll have dr ryan energy chief economist at the bank of international settlement the uh, discussion would be moderated by uh, professor anath narayan from the spjn institute of management and research on day 3 we will have uh, the second key address by professor nuriel rubini professor of economics and international business the nyu stern school of business today we have of course a keynote address by uh, professor michael krema university of chicago may i now call upon uh, ladies and gentlemen mr vikram limai to welcome you all to the conference over to you sir thanks tankar and good evening everyone on behalf of the national stock exchange i welcome all of you to the nsc nyu conference on indian financial markets the nsc nyu initiative was set up in 2012 as a collaboration between the nyu stern school of business and the national stock exchange of india The objective of this initiative is to promote research and finance for effective policy making. The 2020 conference marks the eighth successful year of our engagement with NYU Stern. Over the years, this initiative has served as an international forum for academia and industry to exchange ideas and discuss issues related to finance, banking, corporate governance, and capital markets, specifically relating to India. The initiative supports six research papers every year. which are selected through an international call for papers there is a team of eminent professors from across the globe that is involved in the selection process along with the nsc and nyu these papers are reviewed before and after the conference and are later published under the nsc working papers series on our website a concise non technical version of the papers in easy to understand language called white papers are also published on the website for the non academic community I'm happy to inform you that some of the papers presented in the past conferences have been published in prestigious publications of global repute, such as the Journal of Finance, Journal of Financial Economics, and Management Science. The papers this year comprise research on topics such as portfolio inventory risk, geographical variation in investment, effect of government guarantees on financial stability, power of financial literacy among women. retail trading and ipos role of speculative investors and the effect of armed conflict on lending decisions we have an interesting speaker lineup this year too the highlight of the three day virtual conference is the keynote address by 2019 nobel laureate for economics professor michael kremer of the university of chicago in his address professor kremer will share his insights on investing in innovation for development his speech is very topical as the covid crisis has emphasized the need for innovation and resilience and pushed companies to change their business model and strategies to become more agile and sustainable when it comes to investing in innovation financial markets play a very important role in providing access to capital while equity markets in in india are relatively well developed the bond markets are still at the nascent stage Bond markets are crucial as a source of funding for corporates, in addition to bank credit. Despite the growth in primary issuances of debt securities in the last few years, 
the performance of secondary market in terms of volumes traded has a lot of catching up to do. A vibrant corporate bond market can help provide the necessary long-term funding that will support investment and economic growth in India. The panel discussion tomorrow will shed some light on what India can learn and unlearn from the experiences of developed economies and discuss policy-related actions that will help address some issues faced by India's bond markets today. And last but not the least, we will end today event with another high-profile keynote address by Professor Nuriel Rubini of the New York University. Professor Rubini is a well-known figure in the global academic and business community. In his address, he will share his views on the COVID crisis and the global economic outlook for 2021. As we complete almost a year into the COVID-19 crisis, the world has seen a sharp decline in the growth outlook for a number of economies since the beginning of the crisis, and prospects of an accelerated recovery remain mixed. In this slide, Professor Rubini's address on the future macroeconomic conditions for the global economy will be very insightful. Once again, on behalf of NSE, I welcome you all to this virtual conference. I'm sure we will all gain valuable insights in the discussion schedule over the next three days. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vikram. Ladies and gentlemen, let me now invite Professor Koz John, the NSE NYU Initiatives Program Director, for his introductory remarks to the conference. Let me just introduce him a bit first. Koz John is the Charles Wilson Gerstenberg Professor of Banking and Finance at the Stern School of Business, New York University. He has been a visiting professor at the University of Chicago, Columbia University, Temple University, and Institute de Tour Politique de Paris. He has won several awards, including the Battery March Fellowship in 1983 and the Jensen Prize for Best Paper published in 2000 in the Journal of Financial Economics. He has been on the nomination committee for the Nobel Prize in Economics since 2016. His recent interest in research include fintech, blockchain economics, corporate bankruptcy, dividend policy, corporate governance, top management compensation, institutions, and innovation. He has published over 110 research articles. He has mentored 106 doctoral students. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Koz John. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Ted Tanker. Hello, friends from around the world. Good morning in the US and good evening in India. It gives me great pleasure to invite you to the eighth annual NSC NYU conference on Indian financial markets. Usually this conference is held at NSC in Mumbai. This year, of course, we are holding it virtually. The conference is three days. It's uh, as, uh, as uh, Vikram said, this has been an initiative going on since 2000 and 12, you know, a lot has happened uh, in the last eight years. In terms of GDP, India's economy now has grown to uh, $3 trillion. It's like uh, the fifth largest economy in the world. In real terms, of course, India is the third largest economy in the world. With a democracy and 1.4 million people, India, of course, is a big player in the world scene especially with uh, kind of a declining relationship between China and the US, India has become even more important. Now, the thing is, a lot of things have happened in India. We have various reforms, reforms of uh, inclusion, banking reforms, capital market reforms, the taxation reforms, all kinds of things have happened. And yet, people think, or there is an impatience in the speed of reform. There is an impatience in the growth rate in India. You know, we feel like things are not happening fast enough, but you know, it's so important. So India, for example, with an average age of 28 years, it's a very young labor force. And of course, all the things that we do will further determine what India is going to do in the coming century. So here is something uh, very, very important. And yet we feel as a part of the initiative that there isn't enough India-focused research. And part of the uh, goal of this initiative is to 
discover, search out, highlight very high quality India focused research. As uh, Vikram said, we have been administering this grant program very successfully. And we want to emphasize that many of the grant supported papers, so we go through a long process of uh, reviews and further work and uh, data support from the NSC and all kinds of things. Uh, the culmination is that many of those papers are actually getting published in the very top uh, finance and economics journals. So this is something we are uh, very careful about. I also find out, we did a little search. We have a global uh, institute at NYU. Uh, you know, events such as these, which is focused on India-focused research, those events are actually quite rare. So if you look at the world scene, there are events like these on China research, but not so much on India research. Of course, there are general business meetings about how to do business in India and things like that, but something focused on very high quality, very high level research, it's, uh, I think we are one of the uh, pioneers in this uh, effort. Okay, I want to tell you that uh, we have this amazing program. So since both Vikram and Tirtankar mentioned it, talked about it, uh, we have an outstanding program. We have Professor Kramer uh, talking about uh, innovation and development. And of course, Professor Nouriel Rubini talking about his own uh, perspective on uh, the future always interesting uh, then there is a wonderful panel discussion about uh, bond markets in india we have a wonderful panel so please uh, look at the program carefully we are uh, very tightly scheduled so everything is going to be exactly on time now i should make two words of thanks one is uh, dr patnaik and his team has been just amazing. So everybody has been quite hands-on. Uh, Ashiana, uh, Saurabh Mehta, Prerna Singhvi, Runu Bhakta, all, all of them have been practicing WebEx with me and being involved in the program. Uh, it's just an amazing team. I just want to thank you all. Of course, before I conclude, uh, the success of the conference would not be there without the active participation of a community of scholars who are very interested in India-focused research. They have been participating in various ways uh, in the grant program, uh, doing their research, participating in all our conferences. So I want to thank you all for participating again even though this year we are holding it virtually. So thank you very much. Enjoy the conference. Look at the program to see what events are taking place at what time. Uh, and then, of course, today we have uh, two papers. Uh, we have uh, the first paper about how does lending and conflict affect lending in the border states. Brunal Mishra and Stephen Onjena, a great paper. And then we have uh, a second paper is about empowering women and how does it lead to more active capital markets. Great papers by uh, Dennis Philip, Iftikhar Hazan, and company. Uh, we have two great discussions. Arko Dipta Sarkar is going to discuss the uh, first paper, and Gonul is going to discuss the second paper. Okay. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. So now, actually, uh, the way the day is laid out, we're going to have presentation and discussion of the supported papers, the first two papers I mentioned, and then we're going to have the keynote address. Okay. So uh, I think, Tirtangar, shall I go on to the presentation of the first paper? Good. Let's go to the first paper. Okay. Brunal, are you here? Thank you, Professor 
course, and uh, to the people, to the folks at NSC for inviting us to present and um, for putting this together in these times. And I think Professor Coase has heard this presentation exactly a year back, but uh, maybe we've added something new, so you might find it interesting. Okay. So this is joint work with, um, with Stephen, who's also on the call. And I'll quickly jump into it because we don't have too much time. We have like 20 minutes. So the first thing uh, which I would like to talk about when we speak of uh, the effect of conflict on lending is that e is research on conflict even relevant? Because if you look at the past trends, especially after the Second World War, because of the state monopoly on um, on violence and increase in commerce literacy and um, economic development, uh, conflict has actually been drawing down successively over the past few decades. And this is very well uh, summarized in Steven Pinker's book, which I would encourage most of you to read if you have the time. Now, even though that might be the case um, as a general trend, there still are pockets in the world where conflict is relevant. So there were about 71 million people uh, displaced in the last 25 years, especially in the Middle East. And a lot of uh, babies are born into a conflict area. So it does make for an interesting understanding because there are still pockets of the world which, is, which are not as um, peaceful, if I have to use that word. Uh, recent events have also kind of moved in this direction. So there has been increase in policy uncertainty, especially after COVID. This is from uh, the Stanford Global Economic Policy Uncertainty Index. And there is also some increase in uh, geopolitical uncertainty. This is from uh, BlackRock, and they use like a text-based measure of figuring out whether geopolitical uncertainty increased in the past few years or not. So uh, increase in uh, risks do lead to conflict. And this is what our motivation is, that there could be some incidences, given the kind of situations we've had in, had in the past, so, which makes this kind of research relevant in the current context. And the motivation, the primary motivation of our paper is that most people believe ex ante that uh, the incidence of conflict completely negates economic activity in those regions, but that is not the case. So life continues with a renegotiation of contracts with more attuned to ground realities. What we try to do is we try to quantify these effects of conflict in a lending context and try to measure the premium these agents attribute to the environment. And what we show that these uh, costs are not trivial, so this is about 20 basis points, which might uh, seem trivial on the whole, but this is a within loan kind of an effect. And there are some um, results which we have in our paper which clearly show that this forms a significant bandwidth that the loan officers have in this particular region. As an inferential kind of a thing, uh, based on our research, this could be also applied to, say, other non-conflictuous uh, political economic shocks, given the nature of our setting, and I will get to that later. So what do we do differently? Uh, what we do is that we measure the impact of contemporaneous, that is, ongoing and repeated incidences of conflict on a bank-to-business credit contract. Our study actually covers a period where, actually, a region where there is intense uh, war-like conflict, a lot of people migrate to those regions, but the best part is that, excuse me, about uh, 10 kilometers away, it's absolutely normal. And this is a uniqueness of our setting. Now, what we also add is that most of the extant research has tried to use surveys to try and understand how people react or how people kind of uh, behave after conflict uh, situations. Uh, and this actually involves some kind of a bias because it asks people to go back in time and uh, individuals might weight uh, recent outcomes more as compared to what they experienced a decade ago. Whereas uh, we use um, immediate and contem contemporaneous incidents and on a credit register-like situation, which does not involve these subjective biases to get into our results. Uh, I'll quickly just touch upon the prior research because there's a lot of results to show. And two of the most seminal papers which we've seen in this particular area, one is, one is by Foos and his co-authors in AER in 2012, another by Callan and his co-authors in 2014, and both use uh, conflict experiences, one in, in Burundi and the latter in Afghanistan, to see how individuals affect risk-taking and um, behavior uh, after these episodes. So I will not describe those papers in detail because we have quite a bit of uh, results to cover. But I would encourage most of you, if you do have the time, to uh, browse over them. Our, the summary of our results is that we see over our events, there's a 20 basis points increase for branches which are located in the areas affected by the shelling um, or the conflict which manifests itself as shelling, which I will explain later. And the immediate uh, short run reaction is actually equal to the long run equilibrium that one would expect for conflictuous regions. However, we do see that over time, 
there is some kind of um, overcompensation if you want to put it or kind of an overreaction because the loan officers end up charging more than what they should have uh, as per the equilibrium levels. We don't see any negligible, we don't see any change in loan, loan amounts. And this has some interesting implications, which I will again explain uh, in the future slides. Um, I know this is an Indian audience, so I don't want to get into the primarily an Indian audience, let's say that. So I don't want to get into the uh, history and the politics behind it. People know uh, these stories, but I will just quickly touch upon the fact that we uh, our research is located in this particular region, which is uh, the region of Jammu and Kashmir. And this is unique because it has many different borders. So there is a de facto border, there's a DGR border, not just with Pakistan, but also with, uh, with China. So, um, and this is what we tried, we are trying to exploit. So if you look at the, uh, these are the districts of this particular uh, province, the Indian administrative administered part of Jammu and Kashmir. And the districts in bold is where we situate our study. And these two in bold, but in, but in italics are the places where conflict has been occurring for the last 60, 70 years. And we use that as a kind of a measure for a long run equilibrium impact. And then we try and understand uh, whether these three districts, which we focus our study on, how exactly uh, loan officers or agents behave over there based on these recent incidents. So this is the map of the of the districts of, uh, of Jammu and Kashmir, and these three are the districts which we'll be focusing on. And what is interesting is that this province has a de facto border all across, but it is just along these three districts that there is a de jure border, which has been a, which was kind of uh, agreed upon, and idly both countries recognize it as an international border, as a de jure border. So any Incidences of conflict along these three districts are not expected, so as to say. So if you go to the newspaper and do like a Google search for people of you who live for people who live in India, most of you do know that we keep hearing some kind of news snippet about something kept happening um, along the districts. But it is primarily in, in these two districts, mm -hmm. which is Rajauri and, and Poonch, which are, you know, um, in italics here. So what we do is that, uh, as I told you, we use the international border or the DGR border, also known as the Rat Radcliffe line, and this acts as a setting for our uh, for our study. And this interstate conflict primarily manifests its, manifests itself through shelling. That is mortar gun firing. Both armies, you know, they uh, engage in this mortar gun firing. But because it is not commonplace for this to occur in these three districts, we distill incidents, uh, especially starting after 2014 which coincides with our data availability. And what this shows is that the scale of the incidences actually increased in this 2014, 2018 period. It was much more uh, impactful and stronger because we measure this through how many people migrated. So I will show that to you uh, maybe in, in, the, in the next couple of slides. And we only select those, couple of, those incidences when there was a large scale migration between um, from these border areas to areas which are not affected. So, this is our uh, setting, so if you have to put it. The red dots are the branches which lie within this uh, zero to 10 kilometer range from the de jure border. And the green dots are the branches which lie from 10 to 20. Why do we choose this 10 kilometer range? So these mortar guns don't have a range of more than um, six or seven at most. And we extend it a bit more to two, two and a half kilometers more to see that um, to actually account for the possibility that there are people who could be living in that um, region and might be banking in branches which are in this seven to ten range, and I will show you, or if people want to see, there is there are uh, there is stuff we have in the paper as well as in the appendix, which shows that the effect actually s drops off significantly after after the six kilometer range. So, it, most of the effect lies in that particular, you know, the tight band between zero to uh, seven, seven and a half. And just an example of a mortar gun. Uh, which is used uh, by the army, and uh, it has a range of about, as you can see, seven kilometers uh, at maximum, which can be extended maybe to like eight at most. So these are the three events um, which we use for our setting. And the first event, um, we choose these events based on whether these uh, shelling or uh, pseudo warlike incidences displaced people from their uh, areas or not. And uh, we do this by actually hand collecting all the news articles and then skimming through and seeing that which events actually resulted in large scale internal migration. And we select and make those our major events for. And the setting is a, is a standard DID, which 
um, most of you might have guessed, but I, I will come to that later. Our data comes from uh, the largest lender who is close to a monopolist in the state of uh, Jammu and Kashmir. And uh, they're pretty much a monopolist because for the period we have uh, in our data, they have about 72% of the lending targets, about close to half of the branches. So they are pretty much present in even the most uh, remote regions of the state. So as such, the data is not clearly a, an impediment in that sense because we are able to cover um, a majority of the spread in terms of uh, bank branches. And uh, as I mentioned, we do an assessment of the new news, news articles collected by the uh, South Asian Terrorism Portal and we drill down to these three events. We also collect the geocodes uh, from Google Maps and then we subsequently measure the distance from the border for each of those branches for which we collected the geocodes and then create this 0 to 10 and 10 to 20 kilometer kind of a, uh, a, a cutoff. There's also some data which we use for controls and this is probably from the rural workforce um, program called the uh, Mahatma Gandhi Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme. Um, I will come to that later because when we when I explain the results because I will quickly show people the results. In summary statistics, again, I'm going to skip over this. Um, the main empirical specification, as I told you, is a standard DID, where uh, treated are the branches which lie within 10 kilometers and the controller from 10 to 20, and the events uh, constitute the, the post. And we have these regressions are done within loan because, you know, it is possible that if you compare uh, an agricultural loan to a consumer loan, it would not make sense. So, excuse me. We do this uh, within loan specification. That specification, that is why the effect comes down to you know only twenty basis points, but it's still significant. You know, it is pretty large percentage of the bandwidth of these loan officers. And we have um, a vector of demand specific controls, uh, district and time fixed effects, the usual type of things. The demand specific controls are the bank deposits as well as the uh, the MN regs uh, workforce demand numbers for each of the sub districts. So the results, um, we uh, the outcome is log of interest rate, and we see there's a successive increase in interest rate for each of our events. We control for rural work demand using number of persons who ask for, who register or demand work. And this is uh, quite interesting, and I have a special slide denoted to that. I will come to that. We also control for deposit levels because deposit levels and as the robustness even change in deposits could determine your interest rates, especially around uh, the time we have this chilling event. So uh, this is one of the other controls. The R squares you might think are high, and uh, this is there is some spurious thing going on over here, but the reason for that is because we control for a loan type fixed effects. That is, we do this within loan comparison. The moment you take that out, the R squares drop down to like about 30 to 40 percent. They drop to, yeah, 30 to 40 percent. So as I mentioned, there is no effect on loan amounts, which is uh, what we see here. And th this is uh, interesting. So if you think the interest rates are going up, but the loan amounts are not changing. So th this this is um, what this implies is at the same time you have an increase in loan demand or a decrease in and a decrease in loan supply. So we have to disentangle this demand from supply, which which kind of uh, is interesting. And if you think of it, an increase in loan demand is obviously driven by reseeding of economic activity, pent up demand and those kind of things. Whereas a decrease in loan supply may be due to the reaction of loan officers to what they experience. And they, this kind of you know puts them off uh, and um, they decrease the loan supply to account that they, to account for the fact they don't lose more on these uh, regions. So what we do is that we control for um, shelling specific hyperlocal uh, economic demand effects using this uh, work demand of the of the MN regs. And the work demand pattern is deseasonalized because there's a seasonal pattern to it. I mean, when there are, when it's not the cropping season, it is higher and uh, otherwise it's lower. And what actually this does is, is that if you think of it, if the local economy is doing well, then the work demand uh, will not be so high, which is uh, expected. And there is some, uh, there's a paper on this as well, because people don't want to, um, um, sign up for this uh, government sponsored program and this could either imply that the loan if the work demand 
if the lo local economy is doing better, it implies either that the loan demand is higher or the loan supply is higher, and that has a interpretation on the interest rate. Similarly, if the local economy is not doing so well, the work demand is going to be higher, and that similarly has another interpretation in terms of loan demand and loan supply. So if you think of it, if I just reduce my arguments to the fact that work demand decreases, then either uh, interest rates would go up or down. And if work demand uh, increases again, interest rates would go down or up. So the point being here is that work demand has a negative or positive relationship with interest rates, depending on whether loan demand or loan supply dominates. So what we observe at the end of the day, the factor loading, whether it is positive or negative, will give us a sense of whether loan demand or loan supply is dominating in our setting. And this is kind of interesting because if you, if I could just permit myself to go back to the results quickly, is that for event um, three, which is around when the demonetization occurred, the factor loading is, is positive, whereas for the other two events, it is negative. So um, again, uh, coming back to the, to the slides, this kind of shows is that well, in the third event, it was loan supply, which dominated because of this, uh, this positive factor loading. Whereas in the first two events, it was more of a loan demand kind of a thing. So this is just some justification to tell you that what we've used kind of makes sense in this setting. Uh, we plot the, the DID betas, not just for uh, this one particular event, but also you know uh, going ahead, a few, just shifting our uh, horizon uh, a month later for both the international uh, border, that is the DGR border, and the de facto border for those two districts, which I showed you where the thing occurs uh, repeatedly. And as you see, that um, in the beginning, when you start off with, there, there, there is not much difference between the de facto and the uh, and the DGR uh, borders. So both the short run reaction is more or less equal to the long run equilibrium reaction, which one would expect. But once the repeated incidences start occurring, then as we fit like a spline, we see that uh, these effects are uh, substantially higher than one would have expected because of a long run, owing to the long run, long run equilibrium effect. So. Uh, going ahead, I quickly, I, I think I'll just um, skip over this because this is just a regression econometric interpretation of the graph that I showed you. So I want to show you some of the um, mechanisms and, and, and channels that we were exploring. So what we do is we try to understand whether this takes place via vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, beliefs. So do the loan officers change their beliefs because of what they observe? Or what they observe, or it's like a permanent change in terms of preferences. And we use this weighting function, which kind of, it's not exactly similar, but mimics the one in Malmendir and Nagal. And we create a kind of a weighted shelling measure, which what it does is that instead of keeping um, this uh, coding, the time periods as zero and one during the shelling period, we kind of construct a consecutive measure. You know, it is, uh, it is more, it is continuous instead of being discrete in those regions, in those times, I'm sorry. And this is how exactly we do it, where age is how long the branch has been around and K is how long it has uh, been. Uh, lambda is a weighting function, which um, Malmed and, and Nagel choose to be around 1.5, if I'm not mistaken. But we change this lambda and we see that this weighted shelling combined with uh, the effect on the affected branches remains pretty much a strong and significant irrespective of lambda. So uh, the point being here is that when these when um, you experience something or when you experience this event immediately after you have a tendency to charge higher interest rates vis-a-vis -vis as you move away from from this particular event so that that is the point uh, in uh, a broader point which uh, i wanted to point out here there's also some, some other stuff how much time do i have okay i have four minutes so I, i'll quickly just uh, apply side effects we construct the supply slippage variable which tries to understand what is remaining in terms of lending targets for each of the for the for the branches and we then control for this and try to see whether our uh, fits are dominated by uh, supply side effects and they don't really change much so for the for the third event we don't have a supply side the supply slippage variable because we don't have the data but for the first two events our results don't change much it's just a robustness uh, measure to kind of control for any push effects which might be coming into play because of targets allotted to these loan officers by their uh, higher ups in um, in the headquarters or in the branches I'll, I'll i'll quickly skip over this i wanted to show something interesting because um this is an interesting result that we have for close contest uh, constituencies so what we do is 
we allocate our branches to assembly constituencies where there was a close contest. A close contest is defined as those assembly constituencies where um, the difference between the first person was less than the number of votes polled by the third person. So the idea to understand or to do this is to see whether uh, what we are seeing has some kind of, um, a push from the lawmakers or the government or not. And if you see, in fact, it goes in the opposite direction. So the second shelling event occurs around the time when there were legislative assembly elections in this particular state. And if anything, this close contest areas where there is a close contest, they seem to be causing um, lower interest rates in this particular uh, in the in those branches which are situated in these close contest constituencies. And this kind of makes sense, you know, maybe the uh, when they contest for elections, they promise something with that uh, we will ensure that you get lower interest rates because you are situated in effect in areas which are uh, being pummeled by by shells from the other side of the border. But this kind of dissipates in the third event. So uh, promises are kind of temporary. And then once the third event occurs a year later, these effects uh, don't persist anymore. So this is just something interesting which we had in our extended results section. I thought I wanted to show all of you. Uh, qu I'll quickly conclude. So we study the uh, altered response of uh, loan officers to repeated and episodes of uh, conflict in this in our setting shelling we show that there is success of increase in interest rates and over and above the equilibrium values that one would uh, expect though we observe um, a overreaction kind of sorts and then the final outcome is persistent and worse off for the borrower a lot of it is driven by the beliefs of the loan officers and uh, one of the things which are key policy actions is that uh, banks could actually tighten credit when faced with such kind of shocks, um, whether political or economic. So this requires some kind of push on the policy side to ensure that a credit flow takes place, which a lot of uh, central banks have done, if you see the last uh, few months, especially with the coronavirus pandemic. So yeah, uh, that's it uh, from my end. Thank you, Mbrenal. So our discussant is Arco Dipto Sarkar from HKUST. Arco Dipto, yeah. you can share the screen now. Uh, thank you for... Uh giving me the opportunity to discuss this paper. So uh, Mrinal has already done a very good job in explaining the main findings of the paper. So I'll just go briefly about the main uh, key takeaways of the paper. So the paper studies the role of armed conflict on the lending decisions by bank loan officers. They use the border state of Jammu and Kashmir in India and incidences of cross-border shelling as the setup for the empirical design. So the shelling incidences they show are associated with increase in the interest rate of the loans. However, there is no change in the quantity of lending. Now, the authors try to control for uh, demand and study the impact particularly generated through the reduced supply. They use a, uh, like a lot of uh, different ways to control for that. One of them is district fixed effects. The other thing is like, uh, employment data through the uh, NREG as a proxy for local demand, and so on. And finally, they provide some suggestive evidence about changes in belief about the future conditions leading to future default in this area as a mechanism due to which uh, managers are charging higher interest rates. So uh, I'll, I'll keep my comments uh, to focus to one particular aspect or two particular aspect of the paper. The first one being the difference between demand and supply that uh, Mrinal already highlighted. And let me just deconstruct what the logical flow of the idea is. So one starts with the equilibrium price and quantity. And what Mrinal uh, finds is that the interest rate increases and the loan amount doesn't change, indicating that the demand has uh, increased. However, the supply has gone down. So that is the only condition that would lead to increase in interest rate. However, no change in the quantity of lending. Now, the daunting task that Mrinal has is to control this demand and just to identify the effect that is coming from the supply. So what Mrinal effectively wants to do is mimic a situation of this nature where, uh, where uh, the demand curve doesn't change, the shift is entirely due to changes in supply. Now, if one needs to replicate this incident uh, or, or this experiment, and this premise, uh, after controlling for the demand, one could expect that the, the, the following thing, the magnitude of increase in interest rate 
before and after after controlling the demand is lower than what it would have been before the controlling of demand and also quantity of le lending after one has already control for the demand should decrease as has been shown in this particular figure that once you control for the demand just the just the supply side factor could should lead to a decrease in demand however we do see that loan amount is uh, the change in loan amount is statistically insignificant, even after including the variables which uh, has been highlighted to be the proxies for demand, like fixed effects, uh, or like district fixed effects and so on. If at all, we find that the coefficient on the lending outcome is positive with a very high significant, very high economic magnitude in some cases, which is more than 100%. So it gives some, some kind of uh, apprehensions whether the demand uh, the demand specific factors has completely been controlled for or not. The other controls that has been used for demand, which are like uh, the Narega deposits, etc., could themselves be in impacted by the incidence of conflict. So this, uh, so there could be this classic problem of bad controls in this regressions, and uh, as has been highlighted by Andrew Pishke in their like a very classic textbook of harmless econometrics. So like using this, these particular variables as the controls for demand, whether it rightly does that in the economic specification or not is kind of debatable in many situations. Now, the other point is, is interest rate the most effective tool under the disposal of the loan officers to check the supply or the quantity of loans that they are disbursing? So there is very less degree of freedom for the loan officers in a, in a setup of India to change the interest rate highly. So one would expect that managers would reduce lending to certain section of borrowers whom they feel are, are likely to default more, which is more under the policy, uh, uh, under the domain of the individual uh, loan officers. Now, uh, I was thinking that other than separating supply and demand side of story, would it be interesting to tell the story in the way that would highlight the effect of conflict on the overall lending in in a in a uh, in, in a scenario in India, and and the way that it causes misallocations across different places in India, and that thereby causes slow recovery post the conflicts. The author could then study the causes of such misallocations, which Mrinal does very well in uh, differentiating between learning through beliefs or risk preferences, and also look at other sort of measures like, say, investments, projects, which are post this conflict events, which could lead to have a delay in those projects following this, this increase in interest rates by the, uh, by the banks and so on. And, and probably use the Narega or other measures like satellite nighttime images as possible real economic consequences of conflict that has its genesis through the reduction in lending or charging higher interest rate by the bank managers and not particularly go through the route of separating supply and demand neatly in a situation where they themselves acknowledge that demand and supply shifts quite much uh, in order for their results to go through. Now, the next point that I have is the point that uh, Mrinal highlighted in his talk about the changes in belief. So one thing is it is not clear how shelling instances can lead to better learning in, in order for individuals or loan officers to change, uh, change their belief about the future defaults. So shelling could, in fact, cause to le loss of information, which could lead uh, managers to pool everybody, leading to low, uh, pooling everybody to be low type and leading to higher interest rate of those borrowers. And over time, this could lead to a market for lemons and thereby interest rate uh, causing decrease in the quality of borrowers itself and not the supply over reaction in the long run, if, if, if that is what, uh, what the paper is trying to show. Now, one thing that Minal could look at is to separate learning from other sources is to look at, say, new versus repeat borrowers, because new borrowers, the, the managers would have higher information about borrowers who already had an existing relationship, whereas the information about new borrowers could be much more volatile. 
Next, they could have looked at standard deviation within the loan portfolios of an individual loan officers, like a better information could lead to better screening, causing higher standard deviation within the portfolio of a loan officer, while lower information could pool everybody leading to lesser deviation or lesser standard deviation across the the uh, the borrowers of a low uh, of the portfolio of a, a loan officer that are there in the sample that, through that they could know whether it's learning and better screening or or pooling everybody into the same low level equilibrium so those are my major points so there are some uh, other points which i wouldn't spend much time talking about these are primarily uh, for uh, Mrinal's own thing. Just one point I wanted to highlight is that there are time varying uh, demand specific factors that could be there in, in this scenario. So just the district fixed effect might not be able to ca capture the, the time uh, specific demand variation. So they could uh, their, their setting could allow them to inc uh, include district interacted with time fixed effect just to have their outcome come from two very narrow geographical definition of area within the same district, but across the shelling uh, domain of uh, of the of the motor shelling domains. And there are some more other comments which I can share uh, with Minal probably after the talk or sometime later. And uh, just to conclude, so it's an it's a very interesting paper which study the financial consequences of cross border conflicts. Uh, the setting and the granularity of the data indeed provides a very good empirical design for uh, for this kind of analysis. Now, now the finding can the finding that the paper provides can be a very important has a very important policy consequence for to understand the recovery post the conflict situation. I would think that they should think through the possible bottlenecks while disentangling demand versus supply and tell their story, particularly through the supply channels. But I'm looking forward to read uh, the next version of the paper and strongly encourage everybody to have a look at the paper and, and read uh, themselves. So thank you. This brings me to the end of the my discussion. Thank you, Arko. Uh, yeah. So, you know, now, uh, Mrinal uh, or Steve, uh, if you want to make some response, this is a great time. And then let me just uh, ask uh, people can, uh, other people with comments, they can uh, raise their hand. Or if you're a panelist already, you can just uh, ask your question. Uh, are there questions in the Q&A as well, Tirtankar, you think? Yeah, you can also put your questions in the Q&A, okay? So, Mrinal, yeah, okay. So, I'll uh, quickly respond to Orko first. I think um, he's right about uh, the demand specific factors. So, what we do plan to do, and I've not done so far, is match, uh, you know, census characteristics of villages to each of the branches, and then try and get a kind of a, uh, if you have to put it like a weighted measure around a branch of uh, what are the census uh, level characteristics. So, this would still not solve the the varying characteristics across district, but would uh, go to solve a lot of the other problems, which uh, probably he states in terms of that um, uh, the rural work demand also being affected by this to some extent. But because there are many uh, characteristics which be which, which would not be affected because of uh, because of this kind of uh, shelling incidents, and the census captures all of that. Uh, the second thing which he talks about is uh, the alternative story. That is interesting. So I have not thought about it. So probably I'll. Uh, uh, we'll go that little bit. We'll go over that a little bit more in detail, and I'll also speak to Orko about it. Um, the lots of um, information. I'm actually not so. Um, I was. I, I'll try to process it, but uh, I, I'm trying to understand whether he means because it destroys some uh, the branches and hence leads to loss of information, or did he imply it in a different uh, perspective? But thanks for that suggestion as well. So I think uh, it was very well uh, uh, thought through. The problem with using demand into time fixed effects is that you know. These are like short periods of about uh, two months. And if you include demand time fixed effects, they would uh, just absorb what we are trying to detect. So, you know, your our outcome variable becomes collinear with, uh, with the demand uh, interacted with time fixed effects. There, there are some questions in the Q&A. Uh, I'll quickly try to uh, tick them off uh, as, pos uh, as quickly as possible. Srinivas asked that, asked that, can you use loan volume at the distant branch as a control for loan demand? Um, it's possible, but we are not clear how 
uh, the loan volume of the distant branch can be used as a control demand for for loan demand for uh, a branch which is like um, say 10 kilometers away is there any variation across uh, secured and unsecured loans so uh, i think what you mean by collateralized and non collateralized and i think there is a table uh, somewhere over there so most of um, so I, I i think that what we do notice is that uh, there is a decrease in productive lending of some sort but uh, not necessarily so much uh, in terms of uh, changes in secured and unsecured what about selection bias because of people who are uh, does varying the rental range make a difference so it uh, we have some results based on um, uh, varying the 10 kilometer range and the results do persist uh, for in fact it increases as you move away from the 10 to 20 if you go from 11 to 21 12 to 22 and so on and so forth the effect increases and then after a certain point it kind of uh, drops off so um, and as i also mentioned there is also some results on which portion within this 10 kilometer range has more of a of an impact and we show in the paper that till six or seven is where uh, the maximum effects lie uh, what about selection bias because people are rejected for loans uh, yes i mean that is uh, something which we cannot do about i mean the the data set has only approved loans so uh, yeah i mean there would I mean, this kind of selection bias probably exists in all credit registers, so that is something we cannot really work around. Please uh, inform that it was collected. Okay, so that is something I can let you know, but I don't think it's it was hand collected. So it was collected via the personnel at this particular bank, and uh, yeah, so we approached them directly. You would consider formal informal lending. I don't fifty percent lending are uh, so we have just did a formal lending. I am sorry, but we cannot really account for informal lending because I understand a lot of it is through informal sources, but this is uh, formal lending. And finally, uh, the loan officers may not have a discretion until the police state a type of. So yes, uh, this is exactly what even Orko was pointing out that they might not have a discretion on states, and they, and I am saying that they don't. But they do have a small discretion, and uh, the effect that we are finding is 20 basis points, which we show in terms of like uh, uh, normal distribution curves in our paper. You will see that this 20 basis points forms a pretty significant percentage. I would say uh, the mean of this would be down 20, 25 percent of the bandwidth that they have, which is a pretty fairly large bandwidth. So if 20 basis points is forming like a, a 25 percent bandwidth that you can um, work around with, I think this is uh, a fairly uh, significant number and we all know they can't increase it more than 5 10 15 um, basis points so um depending on the type of loan. so yeah that's it steve uh, do you want to add anything or uh maybe on the uh, on the dispersion of loan rates that's actually a really good idea we haven't thought about that and and, and maybe we can indeed also provide uh, with some exercise on this and also an interpretation in terms of loan officers having uh, fear or no time or no, no no longer ability to process uh, loans adequately uh, so i think that's a really nice nice idea the other one is on the real outcomes and they're actually I mean, I'll didn't address that but we, we have actually already uh, started to collect um, uh, real economy activity data indeed from satellite uh, satellite images thank you thank you so much for the very very nice co the comments thank you steve okay uh, any more uh... Questions? I thought it was a very interesting paper. You know, so I think in general, how much does the lending and borrowing change? You know, one issue I thought might be interesting is, you know, sort of taking a step further. When you have a conflict situation, is it that you worry about, you know, just in general, there is less contracting possible you know your world is changing and that's one issue and then the, the other issue would be uh enforcement you know of any contracts would be less possible so you know i don't know these are sort of larger issues but you know it's very uh it's very interesting and i don't know whether you've thought about it either of you guys you know it's a but it's a it's like of course here you don't have jurisdictional issues if you had bankruptcy for example and uh, and if you are a conflict situation you know uh, whether there is some strategies or whether some ideas about who is going to enforce the contract you know but 
I guess these are actually Indian Indian territories, right? So there is no there is no issue of jurisdiction. Yeah, yeah. So that's anyway. It's a very interesting uh, paper. I thought uh, it was great. Uh, any other questions uh, coming up? We have one from Ankur Jaiswal. Okay, go ahead. Friends are uh, there in the in the paper, so we we showed it. The parallel trends do exist in the appendix of the of the main draft. I don't show it here because twenty minutes is not enough to like talk about so many things. But it is there in the paper. Okay, Miran. Uh, since no one else knows the question but you, you are seeing the question. It would be good if you read the question and then ask. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I I I don't know actually. I thought everyone is is looking at the questions. Uncle Jaiswal asked that uh, whether we address for parallel trends, and uh, we do address for parallel trends. It is there in the in the main draft of the paper in the appendix section. And the most important decision for the loan officer is to lend or not to control risk. So as I stated, so this is obviously we cannot uh, account for the fact that this is only the loans which were lent out. So we can only see you know what happens once the lending takes place in terms of amount or interest rate. And there is, I, I'm not disagreeing that there will not be a selection bias. I mean, that selection bias exists probably all across all credit registers. So, but then we have to work with the data that we have. So. But, but, but Pranal, it goes in your favor, right? You find actually loan doesn't change. If at all, that will go against what you're finding. That would reduce lending if there would exist any kind of. Yes, yes. Any so, other questions? No, so, uh, oh, I think there are more. How much do defaults increase after uh, uh, the shelling? So there are some changes in, um, I think the defaults are, are, are negligible from what we, uh, capture there, there isn't much change in, in in defaults it is very very minuscule um we do show that there is um at the time of lending there is not a very major difference in terms of uh, the quality as such but as such the defaults don't really change much the vertical affiliation of the area and whether it has changed from one political party to another may affect loan decisions so we that is why we showed that uh, those results with the political affiliation and as you saw that Closer to the elections, there seemed to be some kind of, you know, interest, unsaid interest uh, subvention of some sort. Um, what is also important to note is that recently the government has or has stated that any area within the six kilometer range, even in the de jure border, now those people will be given like benefits in terms of employment and maybe lending and things of that sort. So it has become official, but this is after uh, the period of our study. I think this happened about a couple of years back. Um, will the presence of microfinance institutions in the area have an impact? Um, yes, it could, but this is not an area well served by my microfinance. And the bank which we use is like, uh, in a way, all pervasive. It is like the SBI of that particular uh, State Bank of India, of that particular uh, province. And um, as our quality stated, like if you're seeing the effects in our uh, loan granted sample, then you know the effects would have been more pervasive had there. Uh, if we include those loans which are not granted because of quality issues, so then uh, the results would have been stronger. Than otherwise, so yeah, that's uh, it. Thank you for all the questions. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. Okay. For your comments. Thank you, everyone, thank for you. their questions. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, you. Thank it's you. A nice thank paper. You. We are going to the second paper, which is on the financial literacy of women in India. In the development of its capital market, uh, Professor Dennis Philip is going to present it. His co-authors are Anurag Banerjee, Kamlesh Kumar, and Iftikar Hassan. Yes, and you have twenty minutes. Okay, thank you. So yeah, so I, so I wanted to first um, thank Professor Coase and the NSU organizers for this opportunity to present uh, the paper today. And uh, this paper is actually titled uh, The Power of a Financially Literate Woman. And this is joint work with uh, Anurag Banerjee and Kamlesh Kumar from Durham University and um, Iftikar Hassan from Fordham. So to motivate the research, uh, we see that uh, women are increasingly more active in the workforce and have uh, become greater contributors uh, to household income. For instance, uh, women uh, own around 27% of global wealth and the highest annual growth is observed in Asia, um, reaching around 30% um, in 2009. 
Um, but uh, women's involvement in household financial decision making is, is still limited. Um, in a UBS Global World, uh, Wealth Management Worldwide survey that was conducted last year, majority of women uh, said that they leave important financial decisions to their spouse. In fact, only 23% were willing to take a lead on making long-term planning decisions. So in such a scenario, women are exposed to significant risks, financial risks, especially uh, when faced with unexpected family crises, such as death of a spouse. Um, also, as women normally live longer than men, this poses a significant risk for long-term financial planning. So there are several reasons uh, that may explain why women are not being involved in their financial uh, decision-making of their households. So firstly, it can be gender identity norms and cultural beliefs, which are explicit standards or, or implicit standards defining desirable behavior for a man and a woman, and a woman within intraday, intra, intra household um, decision making. So these uh, norms dictate certain tasks to be women's tasks and certain tasks as, as a man's job. So cultural beliefs can assign certain decision making tasks as inappropriate for women. Um, secondly, there could be uh, risk preferences or behavioral explanations as to why we observe men participating more in certain types of financial products, such as stocks and investments, than, than women. So in this paper, we actually focus on the financial literacy of, of women. So previous studies find that globally, women possess low levels of financial literacy than men. Therefore, a skills-based explanation is that women are not involved in financial decision making since they don't have adequate skills, knowledge, and confidence to manage their household, household finances. So the policy interest from here is whether financial literacy interventions can increase women's involvement uh, in in day to day financial decision making and long term planning decisions. So what do we do in this paper? So in this paper, we actually ask the question, do financially literate women take on higher levels of responsibility in managing their household's finances? So in the data, we observe three levels of financial responsibility. First, no responsibility in managing household money. Second is jointly responsible with spouse uh, in managing their money. And third level is sole responsibility, where a woman or a man would be solely responsible for managing uh, their household's finances. And it is true that, and if this is true, and if financially literate women um, take on higher responsibility levels within their households, then we ask what is optimal in terms of participation in financial products and services. So for this, we examine the financial portfolio choices of ma male-led, female-led, and jointly-led households. And um, are there participation benefits of husband and wife teams jointly leading household finances instead of a man or a woman um, taking sole responsibility. And for participation, we consider um, whether respondents hold um, 18 different types of financial products from six different product market segments in their household portfolio. And we also um, um, look at um, their involvement in informal banking activities uh, such as saving money at home, uh, saving informally, uh, and borrowing money from money lenders. So our data comes from the first national benchmark survey of financial literacy and inclusion, which was fielded in 2015 by the National Center for Financial Education. The, the survey covers around 77,000 respondents, and after filtering out students, singletons, and those without relevant information, we have a sample of uh, 59,405 respondents. The survey captures information on age, gender, education, caste, family structure, employment status, occupation type, uh, income brackets, and location characteristics. We also have two financial access variables. First, whether or not a respondent has banking correspondence in their neighborhood. And the second variable is uh, the number of bank branches in the district. In our sample, we have we observed three levels of household decision makers, those solely responsible, those jointly responsible with their spouse, and those with no responsibility for household financial decision making. 
Um, financial literacy levels of respondents are measured from the, their understanding of seven basic financial concepts. Time value of money, interest uh, paid on loan, uh, simple interest, compound interest, risk and return, diversification, and understanding of inflation. And the survey follows the OECD guidelines to measure the financial knowledge levels of respondents. We, we assign each respondent with a financial literacy score, which we call the Finlet, uh, which is derived as the population weighted average of the number of correct responses uh, to these seven uh, financial literacy questions. Um, next, we observe in the data whether or not decision makers choose to hold any of the 18 financial products in their household portfolio. These products include savings products, investment products, shares and stocks, uh, insurance products, loans and credit cards, and alternative investment products, which is like uh, chit funds, uh, collective deposit schemes, investment in gold and silver, uh, and investment in property. Um, in the data, we also observe whether or not decision makers engage in informal banking activities, such as saving money at home, saving money informally, and borrowing from, from the money lenders. So this table um, reports um, some summary statistics. It reports the responses of men and women on the different financial literacy questions. Um, we can find that across all the seven questions, the percentage of correct responses from women is significantly lower than from men. This is kind of in line with previous global evidence of a gender gap in, in financial literacy. Um, also, we can see that more women don't uh, than men tend to cho choose don't know as their response to the different financial literacy questions asked. And we can also see that there are more women than men in the survey who got none of the seven uh, questions uh, correctly. So now um, we move on uh, to first examine the degree of responsibility men and women take on in managing their household finances moderated by financial uh, literacy scores of individuals. So for this, we estimate uh, ordered private regressions where the latent continuous variable captures the underlying ordinal responses, um, which we observe on responsibility levels. One, which corresponds to no responsibility, two is for joint responsibility, and three is for sole responsibility. And we interact men and women indicator variables with our financial literacy variable Finlet, which, uh, which now corresponds to the financial literacy score of the respondents. Uh, for the control variables in our all our regressions, we include a series of demographic characteristics, which I outlined previously, and we also control for financial access by um, by where, whether or not respondents have banking correspondence in their neighborhood and the number of bank branches in the district. Um, lambda S in these regressions are state fixed events. So these are the first um, uh, estimation results. Um, we find that women, uh, as compared to men, uh, take on lower levels of financial responsibility in making household financial decisions. So this is as expected from previous studies. However, when women are financially literate, the gender difference reverses, and um, women are now significantly more responsible for taking financial decisions in their household as compared to financial literacy, uh, financial literate men. And having established that financial literacy has a positive association with uh, women taking on higher levels of responsibility in, in managing their household finances, we go on to test whether this translates into better portfolio choices for these households. That is, is there a difference in the portfolio choices of households led by financial literate men and women either individually or jointly? And, and for this, we have to jointly model uh, the ordered responsibility levels and the probability of holding for the financial products, both in a, in a, in a structural model. So um, in the responsibility equation, the, the latent continuous responsibility variable is, the, is a function of financial literacy scores for, for men and women. And this is estimated uh, as an ordered profit model as before. Um, we also have a second holdings equation where the response variable is binary, that is whether or not a respondent holds a particular financial product in their portfolio. We also we estimate um, the holdings equation as, as a profit model. The error terms in the two S, uh, equations are related to each other in a seemingly unrelated regression uh, fashion and parameterized 
as a multivariate normal distribution with covariance matrix, which is denoted by sigma. The, the joint estimation of the error terms um, can account for the presence of endogeneity in the relationship between holdings and, and responsibility. So what is our aim? Our actually our aim is to model the relationship between financial literacy and portfolio choices through the different levels of financial responsibility that respondents take on. So for this, we want to estimate the cross margin effects from the two equations seeping from financial literacy into holdings. Um, so from the to, for this, from the responsibility equation, we first calculate the average marginal effects of the changes in responsibility levels for changes in financial literacy. And from the holdings equation, we can calculate the average marginal effects of changes in probability of holding a financial product for changes in responsibility levels. And from these two equations, we can then estimate the, the cross marginals um, can be derived um, uh, and we can estimate um, the changes in the probability of owning a financial product for changes in fi financial literacy levels. So in the empirics, we study the ownership probabilities of six different types of products, uh, savings products, investments, shares and stocks, insurance, loans and credit cards, alternative investments. And we also look into the likelihood of respondents participation in informal banking activities, um, such as saving money at home uh, or borrowing from the money lenders. Um, these are the financial literacy estimates from the responsibility equation in the structural model. A couple of observations here. Uh, the first is that we find that financial literacy marginal effects um, are positive and significant for both male and female respondents. And this holds for all six categories of financial products. Um, secondly, uh, for financially literate male and female respondents, the probability of jointly leading households money matters with their husband and wife um, is greater than, than the respondents taking sole responsibility. Also, we can see that both financially literate men and women take on significantly lower levels of, resp of responsibility in households that are participating in informal banking activities. Um, this is, uh, these are the sole and joint responsibility estimates from the holdings equation in our structural model. And overall, what we see here is that taking increased levels of responsibility in itself is not significantly associated to increased product holdings. So this is actually true for um, all, uh, all formal banking, uh, banking products. And, and interestingly, we find that respondents who take on more responsibility in whole household finances tend to invest more in alternative investment products, such as investing in chit funds, um, investing in gold or silver, um, or investing in property. Um, so this is the, our next table, which is the, the, um, the cross marginal effects of the changes in financial literacy to the likelihood of holding financial products for different uh, responsibility levels for men and women. So this is our kind of main uh, table that we're gonna interpret. So the differences in marginal effects between sole responsibility and joint responsibility are reported under uh, the estimates in, 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 in brackets and the, and the brackets are the p-values that looks at the difference in test between the sole responsibility and the, um, and the joint responsibility levels. First of all, we find that marginal effects for financial literacy on product holdings is positive and strongly significant, whether the respondent is a male or a female, assumes sole responsibility or shares the joint responsibility with their spouses. Second, uh, when we consider sole responsibility, men display greater holdings in product areas with higher returns. So men display in red, men display greater um, holdings in product areas with high risk and return, which is like investment products and stocks. While women are known to be more risk averse, showing greater focus on security products in that. So they invest more in savings products, insurance products and alternative investments. Also, we see that in financial literate women participate less in informal banking, banking activity. Now, this is probably the most important part where we consider results where financially literate women are jointly responsible with their husbands in financial decision making. The addition of the spouse in financial decision making is statistically significant on financial holdings, uh, on all the financial holdings for, for women. And the greatest effects among women are seen for investment products, about 90% for women acting jointly with their husbands as opposed to women acting alone. And for stocks, it's about 72%. 
This shows that the support of their husbands in financial decision making not only helps financially literate women to benefit from women's preferences for high risk return products such as stocks and shares, but it also embodies um, uh, women to play uh, by the strings and keep investing in um, in savings products and insurance products, which which are anyway favored by women. So um, this is actually uh, I'm going to skip that. Uh, the next, I want to quickly look at the cast. Um, so we now look at the marginal effects for financial literacy on portfolio holdings for the different castes uh, within the caste hierarchy in India. And um, this is the first um, first plot of the cross-sectional, cross-marginal effects of financial literacy on the likelihood of holding financial products. We have four categories of respondents here, male um, who are solely responsible, women who are solely responsible, may, men who are jointly responsible, and women who are jointly responsible with their husbands. And each plot is different regressions um, of the different product types. We find the savings products, financial literacy, marginal effects for the general cost is higher and distinct from the other costs. For insurance products, um, the scheduled tribe is distinctly lower from the other three casts. Um, and interestingly, in all cases, the highest marginal effects for the probability of holding financial products are observed when financially literate women are jointly leading financial decisions of their households with their husbands. For investment products um, and shares, general cost is significantly higher than other costs, and the highest probability of ownership is seen again in financially literate women jointly managing household finances with their husbands. Um, for alternative investments, these are kind of all, you know in gold, silver, and um, and property markets. The marginal effects um, of ownership is low among the scheduled caste and um, scheduled tribe, and the highest is for the general caste. Um, and the participation in informal banking activities. Uh, we find negative marginal effects for financial literacy, which is interesting, and the highest gains again are observed when financially literate women are working as a team uh, with their husbands. Dennis, yeah. you should be winding, winding, winding so, up. Yeah. Your conclusion. <laughs> so thank you. Um, so in this paper, so uh, in this paper, what we do is we study male and female decision makers in households. We observe three levels of financial responsibility that each respondent could take on: no responsibility, joint responsibility, and sole responsibility with their spouse. Uh, there, there is a significantly positive relationship uh, between uh, women's financial literacy levels and the level of responsibility that they take uh, in in managing their households' finances. We also show that financial literate women jointly leading with their husbands have greatest marginal effects when it comes to participation in product markets. We examine several streams of financial product product markets. And finally, when we consider households involvement in informal banking activities, we find that households led by financial literate women again engage less in these activities such as saving uh, savings informally and taking loans from money lenders. And these results actually hold across different different casts. Where I had I didn't have time to show you the results for the reasons, but we also investigate the reasons for non-participation by male and female decision makers. And one of the interesting thing is that choice is seen as an important reason among financial literate female decision makers. So the results actually highlight the importance of financial literacy in empowering women in um, take getting involved in in financial decision making of their households. That's it from me. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Very interesting paper. Our discussant is going to be Gonul Kolak from Hankin University. Yes. Uh, thank you, Kos, for inviting me to this online uh, Indian conference. I would love to have been there in person, hopefully in the future. But uh, it's it's great to be among this company, uh, such a company, and. Uh, you know, I'm excited to be part of this conference. Uh, I'm from Hankin School of Economics, and um, uh, you know, try, will do my best to to comment on the paper related with uh, financial literacy in, of women in India. Um, obviously, as I mentioned, I cannot understand perfectly the conditions in India, but in, I will start in general with the key elements of financial literacy. So I, um, I I should emphasize that there are three key elements of financial literacy: financial knowledge, uh, financial behavior, and attitudes towards finance. This paper focuses on 
the relationship between financial knowledge and financial behavior. And I could not find anything about attitudes towards finance. While the paper is great and it has a great potential for contribution, I think that if um, potentially can explore this particular angle either as, a, uh, as an additional test or as a con at the very least as a control variables, could enhance uh, the, the thoroughness of the paper in terms of understanding the key elements of financial literacy. Most surveys usually have these questions about the attitudes. Why does the attitude matter here? Obviously, the attitudes between women and men could be different, but also within women, the general attitude, whether women in general want to be part of this uh, participation should be the key. And hopefully you have in the data this, this variable. So, um, Attitudes and preferences are important element of financial literacy, and I just want to um, emphasize one more time that you know the disposition or preferences towards finance could be exploited here for additional contribution in the literature, because the topic of women literacy in India has been studied before. However, the interesting angle of the paper could be to uh, study the participation and the variety of the products that exist. And that's a great angle of the paper, and I, I would encourage the authors to focus on that by, by linking the attitudes towards finance and the financial products. I think, I believe there are 16 different financial products. So you can report the men versus women, uh, within women do attitudes matter, and also study the mediating effect of attitudes toward the relationship. This mediation effect is something that I will uh, refer again. So um, a formal mediation al uh, analysis could be another interesting uh, angle that the authors can explore here. What do I mean by that? I mean, the authors already analyzed these equations two and three. They do conduct an analysis about the mediation effect of first taking the women taking the responsibility to be household leaders in finance and then choosing the financial product. So responsibility taking or willing, this, willing to take this responsibility is a mediating variable. And there is um, many different ways of doing it. I think the authors have already done majority of the analysis just converting it to formal mediation analysis of the type Baron and Ken does and report formal tests of Sobel, uh, Sobel uh, type of tests could be beneficial here. Again, what, what I am interested in or what potential readers could be interested in is reporting how strong is the mediating effect of willingness to take the responsibility. And again, in this context, attitudes of, of the women could play a key role. Uh, attitudes are, of course, self-determined. Attitudes towards taking risk or within uh, the subsample attitudes towards learning something about this particular topic. Okay, another interesting angle that I, again, I, I like the paper in the sense that it teaches personally me as I discussed something and hopefully every, uh, many other people about this particular issue in India. But I am personally very curious, and I know that there is a substantial shadow banking and shadow economy in India. So the fact that uh, financial literate women or the ones who are better educated in this choose to invest certain products could shed some light on shadow banking and shadow economy in the India, uh, in India. And you know, in the banking shadow banking literature, there, there are different angles that could that have been studied, let's say, in the context of China or in the context of other developing nations. And I know from reading, you know, many um, many, shall we say, financial press articles that women in India tend to invest in gold a lot, like in like they do in, in some other Middle, uh, Middle Eastern countries, like Turkey, for example. Uh, so so. What, how does the, the fact that you can link the women's literacy to investment in gold or non, or other non-official borrowing types can be very useful insights about the likelihood of uh, financial literacy 
affecting the size of the shadow banking in the local regions. So in differences in the regions in terms of literacy, how does it also affect the size of the shadow banking in those regions? Again, this is just a suggestion where the data could be used in a, in a slightly different angle. So another issue here that I thought would be interesting is to explore the local culture. I know the authors are econometrically using fixed effects for the regions. However, social capital, I know, for example, one at least one of your co-authors, Iftikhar Hassan, has done great studies on social capital. However, is there, a, is there a way to explore, for example, the social capital within India, such as trust local norms, and whether they make any difference about the linkages between financial literacy, willingness to participate, and then cho choosing a product? For example, why is this could be important? I think this issue could be important simply because in certain regions or cities or neighborhoods, learning from peers, and this is the key ter term here, learning from peers, and learning how to uh, invest financial in, in financial products from neighbors, from your friends, could be an important angle that facilitates the, the linkages between, uh, shall we say, uh, financial literacy and investing choices. And again, there is a precedent paper such as Bernal and Kumar and Solomon. One possible measure for such effects is just in broad terms is homogeneity of the population in terms of religion, in terms of sub-ethnic uh, uh, divisions. So this could be a, a potentially exploited relatively easily if, uh, if the author choose to do so. Uh, go on, on, three minutes, three minutes. Three minutes. All right, I'm almost done uh, with my main points. I didn't know whether I'm rushing or not, but <laughs> this is good. So another um, thing that I noticed is that certain angles of this financial literacy and women linkages are exploited before. And some of the, let's say, AER studies are not cited in the paper. And uh, therefore, it, I feel like a literature review could provide further hints of what could be potentially studied with this data. I'm not going to go over each paper here, but the fact that I could find some AR papers that are not cited in the paper suggests that maybe not all the angles of uh, the data are exploited. So a bunch of curiosity questions. Again, I don't know whether the data will allow you to do this, but I know from other studies about women, for example, in Finland, there is a very detailed data about women and uh, how many children they have, the, the uh, siblings and so on. If there is an information in the survey data about the number of young children uh, a woman has, this, this has a huge impact of whether uh, women find time to do anything with financial readings or financial decision uh, making. Because obviously, if typically, uh, women spend more time with their with the children than than men, and therefore this will take substantial uh, time of their day, and and therefore wouldn't have enough time to study the uh, decision maker. Therefore, as a sociological question, the number of children could potentially affect uh, these linkages between literacy and participation. So another potential area that could be exploited with the data is the number of siblings of the women, empowerment during the childhood uh, by parents. If we somehow we know the number of siblings, this particular participant, female participant in the survey, if we know about it, this could be an interesting area to explore, explore because it is uh, it does affect how the parents treated this particular female uh, daughter in their case and whether the, they provided sufficient education and empowerment to, to females. Another interesting curiosity question, again, I call it intentionally call it curiosity question because I have not seen the data. I just know about the data based on what you provided in the paper. But if there is sufficient information in your data that could, uh, shall we say, explore, explore it uh, further, further, it could be beneficial to your contributions of your paper. So here is an interesting curiosity question. Which regions of India, the linkages between financial literacy and financial responsibility participation is most pronounced? You, uh, you use fixed effects in the paper, 
But I think as a somebody, uh, again, who tries to learn as much as possible about India from academic papers and other sources, I'm just curious whether this linkage is more stronger in certain regions and why. And also, you know, another curiosity question, if you know the, the information, any differences between widowed, divorced women and single women in terms of their attitudes towards finance? Obviously, a divorced woman would be more likely to have to learn how to you know, manage household finances. And finally, state conditions, I think you should control for them. So I'm almost done, uh, but macroeconomic conditions during the, uh, during the survey could matter. Thank you. Uh, I should say this is a very interesting and um, educational paper for people like me. So I think the data could be further exploited. Thank you. Thank you, Gona. So any one of the co-authors want to respond to Gonul? Yeah, yeah, I just want to. Uh, yeah, thanks, Gonul, for the uh, comments. Um, I mean, all, all, all interesting comments, actually. There's a lot of uh, insights that you're bringing in, which can be exploited further. So it was like a this was the first draft we we pulled together for the you know to meet the deadline for the conference. So it was sort of a pushed uh, quick push. But um, there, those really some of the comments that you've sent sent are excellent. So we're going to look into it, such as looking at the shadow banking um, uh, of the of the regions. Um, yes, mediation analysis. We have all the financial attitudes data. Um, um, uh, covered so we we can easily add them into the paper as control wave but also kind of look look at it explicitly and study the willingness of women to actually engage sometimes we we, we want to we can we can disentangle the willingness to do from the not being involved because of other pa parameters so that's a good angle that we will exploit um about children about the widower and divorced one we actually um, we remove all the singletons out of the of the survey because we wanted to study these dynamics within, within the household, so intra dynamics. So, um, so we have sole responsibility when you are when you are married, and then so and, and also joint responsibility with your spouse. Uh, so it was sort of like we wanted to study the inter inter household dynamics within the husband and wife. That was kind of like the main. Main. So we we actually put took out the um, singletons and students uh, out. We don't unfortunately have information on the number of children. Uh, we don't have mm -hmm. that. So, but we do have information on whether the families are nuclear families, whether they're staying in nuclear families or joint families. So it kind of gives you an indication of the uh, the um, the household dynamics that which we which we actually add as control variables anyway. Um, Regarding uh, linkages across regional uh, factors, this is another good idea that uh, you've said, which is something that we should explore again, because we just, um, you know, put in the fixed effects and kill the effects. But then I think probably it might be a good idea to kind of um, exploit that further. So um, all in all, really good comments, you know, looking forward to kind of taking those things on board and going forward for the next draft. And uh, and um, yeah, and uh, thanks again for for your time reading the paper and for your comments. Thanks. Good luck with the paper. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Any one of the co authors uh, want to uh, make a couple of comments? Otherwise, we look for questions. If you didn't put in a question in the QA, please uh, raise your hands. Dennis, are you able to see any of the questions or? None at the moment. Just to make sure, I can read the, the Q, uh, questions or something here, but I don't know oh, whether oh. Dennis cannot read them. Okay. Uh, I go, go ahead. ahead. Uh, go no. You can uh, you can read it. Oh, yeah, I will start go. from the last one that I see. I don't know whether it's relevant. Belonging to a business family versus a non-business family might matter. For example, there are communities in India which make women more aware about finances. That's a good question. Actually, we do actually. Well, we see the respondent level information, um, so we know the. Um, know whether they are actually laborers uh, or whether they are privately private uh, you know uh, um, working for a private company or they are government civil servants so we do have the respondent level kind of information on their occupation type which we control for but um, that could be one way to link up to the belonging to the business family uh, and that's the only thing i can think about yeah Another comment here is, uh, what is your comment on the increase in financial literacy in India due to Pradhan, Mantari, Janhan, Dang, yeah. Yonia, 
Okay, I have yeah. no idea what that is. Yes, 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 yes. So it's it's sort of like the <laughs> Pradhan Mantri Jantra Yojana scheme, I think. Yeah. So essentially, we we actually at at, at the moment what we have done is we haven't listed explicit products. So we have the um, savings products of different classes. But what we did was we just clubbed them all together as uh, savings products, investment products, uh, insurance products. Uh, instead of looking at exactly one by one the products, but we do have information on whether on 18 financial products um, for each respondent. So we know what the whether the financial whether the uh, household decision maker is a male or a female, whether they are jointly responsible or solely responsible, and whether they hold a particular financial product. So we have we have that information, but we haven't looked in, looked at the explicit um, uh, product that you mentioned. Was it possible for the authors to check the link between? Financial literacy and digital literacy. Yeah, so digital literacy, we. I'm just wondering whether we have the data because uh, there's a, there, there there are 50 50 items uh, we have in the database. So uh, we can do it at the uh, spatial level where we can actually find out the um, the um, the usage of mobile phones and uh, usage of digital technology um, in 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 the district level or. Or at the at the municipal level, and then link that up to to studying digital financial literacy. That can be done, uh, which is an, which is actually an interesting question. Although we don't really observe respondent level digital literacy. Yeah. Here's another one from Madhu. Um, is fintech making an impact on women centric finances? Yeah. So this the, because the uh, survey was done in 2015, um, we did not we don't have those. Um, we we don't capture um, fintech, um, you know, and alternative alternative investments uh, in our in our sample. So clearly, we can we will probably not be able to uh, make direct evidence or direct uh, contribution to that. Because I don't see any further questions. Because you're on mute. I was saying we are right on time. <laughs> I see Mike is already here. We are looking forward to his uh, keynote speech. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Nice paper. A lot of interest in these topics. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Hatik. Yeah. Thank you. We are delighted to have Mike Kramer as the keynote speaker. Mike Kramer, as you all know, is the 2019 Nobel laureate. He's also the university professor in economics and public policy at uh, University of Chicago. The last time I saw Mike present something that was on uh, sort of financing the scaling up of a vaccine, I was interested in the topic myself and I realized he has a whole body of work about financing vaccines in uh, poor countries um, and it's fascinating. But of course, his Nobel uh, Prize he shared the Nobel Prize with uh, Esther Duflo and Abhijit Banerjee. Both Esther and Abhijit have given keynotes uh, in our initiative. Abhijit talked about uh, insurance, health insurance for the poor, and Esther talked about educating the young uh, in, in India. Now, the as I understand it, the approach that uh, Mike jointly with uh, Esther and Abhijit have pursued is basically take the big problem of poverty, global poverty, and then uh, ba basically break it up into specific problems, smaller problems maybe, and then address those with carefully designed field experiments uh, for example, access to textbooks, uh, school meals, deworming the children, uh, incentives for teachers, uh, all kinds of things. And the insight was that you get clearer solutions, uh, you get surprising solutions, and then they have gone on to implement it on a global scale in uh, many countries, uh, so anyway, let me let me let's all listen to Mike. 
He has several editorial positions, organizations that he has founded, uh, and all that. It's all in his bio. Mike, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I, I like to talk about investing in innovation for development today. Um, I should say this is joint work with uh, Sasha Gallant at, at uh, CRI Foundation, Olga Rastapshova, who's also at the University of Chicago, and Milan Thomas at the Asian Development Bank. Um, and I'll be speaking uh, you know, primarily in my academic role at the University of Chicago, but I do want to say I, I'm good. A lot of this paper is going to be drawing on data from a program at USAID, which I helped co-found, uh, called Development Innovation Ventures, and I'm, I, I have an affiliation there, so I, I want to uh, acknowledge that uh, here as well. And I was also involved in a couple of the specific uh, 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 projects that I'll, I'll discuss today. Um, so I think if we if we think about uh, innovation very broadly, you know, it's often driven by the private sector, um, and it's it's obviously if you know that can have tremendous implications for economic growth and human welfare. Uh, you mentioned vaccines. You know, a key example of this and of the of the key role of the private sector is uh, vaccines for COVID nineteen, um, and the Serum Institute is responsible for half the world's manufacturing capacity for two of the leading COVID-19 uh, vaccine candidates. So it's obviously going to, if these are successful and you know, we're, we're all optimistic, um, this, will, this will provide a, immense, uh, play an immense role in getting us out of the, the terrible crisis that we're in now. Now, you know, as, as was referred to, there are some areas where the private sector on its own will probably not invest enough to, to match social needs. Um, and those are products where the, buy, the benefit isn't entirely captured by the buyer or seller. Um, vaccines are one example, um, but um, in part because of, of infectious disease externalities, in part because of political or ethical constraints on pricing, um, in part because of technical factors related to the shape of the demand curve. Um, you could also argue that innovations for the benefit of very poor people are not going to attract the quite the investment that, that innovations that would benefit higher income people would. And I think that creates an opportunity for philanthropists, for government programs, for public-private partnerships to, to address. So you know, one example of this, um, uh, which, which John was probably referring to, was the idea of uh, advanced market commitments for vaccines. So uh, you know, more than a decade ago, well, going back further, I'd done academic work suggesting the idea that uh, for, for diseases where there was, a, uh, there was inadequate um, R&D or inadequate capacity installation, uh, buyers like governments or international organizations should commit that if a product, if an appropriate vaccine was developed, they would help finance the purchase of it. And the idea was that this would create incentives to harness the energy of the private sector in developing and creating uh, factory capacity for vaccines against some of uh, the, the affected diseases that impacted the, the, some of the poorest people in the world. And you know, we originally thought of malaria as our as our focus case, but turned out there's a disease called pneumococcus uh, causes pneumonia um, that there was already a vaccine for the strains of pneumococcus that were common in high income countries, but not necessarily those common in middle and, and, and low income countries. And a group of donors came together and pledged one point five billion dollars that would be used to help finance the purchases of a pneumococcus vaccine. Um, initially, uh, two, two uh, companies based in high-income countries developed uh, vaccines. And just recently, Serum Institute um, developed a, a vaccine as well, although the, the funds are, are largely depleted now from that $1.5 billion. Um, so that's a saved and estimated, um, it's reached, those vaccines have been administered to hundreds of millions of people and they've saved an estimated 700,000 lives. 
So I think that you know, gives some um, some indication of you know one example where this has been been very successful. Advanced market commitment approaches and and related approaches, related poll approaches, have been used for COVID nineteen vaccines, and um, and I think we're seeing the the response from Serum Institute, but many other companies as well. Happy to discuss that type of uh, work in Q and A. What I'd like to discuss uh, today, and, and this what this paper will be about, is about a very different, smaller scale type of uh, of innovation financing, but also where we're, where the public sector is coming in to either spur investments that are probably not commercially viable, or to make things that would might not otherwise have been commercially viable. Uh, get them over the, the finish line to commercial viability. Um, and I'll be talking about something called Development Innovation Ventures, but uh, that's a U.S. government program. But I think there are you know, very related things. I think one very exciting program in India is the Tamil Nadu Innovation Grand Challenge, which um, I think has um, some broad family resemblance. And I've seen some of the work coming out of that. And, and I find it I find it very exciting. I, I, I'd love to learn more about it, actually. OK, so here's the so that was sort of setting the larger stage. Let me hone in a little bit on, on what the focus of today's presentation will be. Um, there are a number of initiatives to promote innovation and development. So some of those are supporting sort of pure science R&D, um, you know, some of the vaccine work. Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is very involved in that. Uh, in agriculture, the uh, CGIAR system uh, is developing new seeds, trying to create, you know, Green Revolution was obviously a big success a long time ago, but they're trying to, to create um, uh, new seeds for today's world, um, drought resistant seeds, et cetera, for climate change. Another big category is social science uh, research. Um, and some of that is RCTs of the type that uh, Esther or Abhijit or, or you know, many other researchers and I are involved in. Uh, World Bank has been a big uh, supporter of, of that type of work. Um, and then a third type is impact investing social entrepreneurship. Uh, there you might think of the Omidyar network as, as an example of, uh, of, of, a, of a funder. Now, the first type of, there's a big tradition in economics of trying to measure the returns to the first type of innovation, um, going back to Grolichus. We're going to try to address two questions based on data from uh, an innovation fund at USAID. First one is, is development innovation a good investment? Do the, what's the return on this? Do the benefits exceed the costs? The second one is, which types of innovation scale? You know, if we're trying to choose among different projects to invest in, is there a way we can have any sense of, of which are likely to be more effective? I guess implicitly, there's a third question, you know, for which we don't really have quantitative evidence, um, but how should we structure programs to support this type of innovation? Uh, I think this will become a bit clearer uh, as I go on. So on the first question, um, you know, we can all think of examples of spectacular successes of investments in innovation for for development aimed at the you know the base of the pyramid, but we can also think of spectacular examples of failure as well. I think that type of anecdote, which is what a lot of the literature consists of, doesn't really get you that far. There's also efforts to do counts, you know, how many successes, how many failures. I think for reasons I'll show you, I think that type of approach can also be very misleading. Well, what we will do is try to, you know, we're, this is an area where most of the literature is very anecdotal, very gray literature. There's not a lot of academic work. We're not going to be bringing this to the level of um, you know, RCT evidence establishing causality, but we will try to uh, to advance the, the state of the art a little bit, um, we're going to try to establish, create a bounding approach to get a lower bound on the, on the benefits um, relative to the cost, on the benefit cost ratio. And that might be enough to answer the question of whether this is a good investment. 
and will apply this approach to the early portfolio of development innovation ventures. So the program has been around 10 years. Um, we'll look at the 2000 through 2012 grants that were made and try to get a lower bound on the benefits. So let me give you a bit of uh, background on this. Um, development Innovation Ventures is, is quite different than many innovation funds. Let me tell you a little bit about the structure and highlight some of the differences. First, it's open. It's open across sectors, geographies, scaling approaches. So sectors, you know, we're not saying, well, we're now interested in agriculture, we're interested in solar energy. We're really open across all, all areas of development. We're, we're not focused on a specific geography, and we're open both to things that would scale commercially and to things that would scale through public sector adoption. So as you can tell, we've got a pretty broad, that's pretty broad, and we also have a broad definition of innovation. We're not just talking about gadgets or software. We're also talking about new business models or, say, applications of behavioral economics to policy questions. So it's a very, it's very broad. How do you deal with that? Uh, you know, there are a lot of other programs out there that are, are quite narrow. How do you, how, you can't have a staff that's special, that knows all of these areas. So what's our approach? Well, our approach is not to try to have all the expertise inside the, the funding agency. We have tiered funding based on r rigorous evidence. The first stage, we're actually just at providing funds for piloting. We don't act, actually ask for rigorous evidence there. The second, and that was at the time, that was up to $100,000. The second stage, which at the time was up to a million dollars, was for testing. That wasn't necessarily with randomized controlled trials, but we were looking for some fairly rigorous evidence on impact and cost effectiveness or on a really market viability. Um, the third stage, which was up, time was up to 15 million, but and now the lo limits are much lower, and in practice was really only. The, the maximum I think was five or, or six, or seven million, something like that, um, was uh, to funds to take things that already had evidence of impact and cost effectiveness and help transition them to scale. I should say, um, you know, if you would like to learn more about, if, if some of you are, you know, connect, you know, have interested in applying or know people who are, um, you can visit the website. The program is, is still going strong, and um, and you. you you can look and see whether it's it's worth applying or whether you seem to fit the criteria. Um, the process, you know, if you think about a lot of venture capital uh, funds, they try, and a lot of social funders as well, feel like they want to really co-create the idea, add a lot of value uh, through technical support and advice. You know, at the time, we were, had hardly any staff. We had pretty strict government procurement rules. Um, they're a little bit looser now, but uh, or more, I don't want to say looser, but more flexible. But at the time, there was very little role that could be played. Even now, um, you know, we couldn't offer, we can't offer feedback on um, at a informal feedback. We have to wait for a proposal that has to go through competition uh, before any feedback can be provided. Um, so there was, there was um, you know, this was really um, not doing what a lot of venture capitalists do. Now, there was, however, peer review. Um, these were often development economics researchers who would, who would review the proposals. And the staff, um, the staff, the, the judge, the decisions were made primarily based on the applications that people submitted, not by an, sort of through an investment memo process written by you know, many foundations. It's actually the staff who write the, the funding proposal at some level. That's not the approach here or the create the investment memo in a venture capital firm. Another area where there was some difference with uh, maybe venture capital investors is, you know, there was a lot of emphasis on the cost of the innovation as influencing the potential for scale. We cared about the potential for scale very much, but we judged that partly based on the cost. We were not necessarily looking for a team that had already proven that its ability to scale things and manage things. And we funded you know, graduate students and, and, and postdocs, for example. Um, the, you know, we, did, we did care about the abilities of the team, but we, we weren't necessarily looking for that uh, management expertise. 
Uh, that's maybe too strong. I mean, we would value that, but we, we didn't require that. Um, also, for innovations designed through the public sector, um, you know, there's often a lot of evaluation funders say, well, we need a separate implementer who has to be putting their money into this and a separate evaluator. And we, unless the implementer is putting their own money into this, we don't think they have skin in the game. We, we don't think this will scale. We were, again, more flexible in our rules. So I think that's sort of useful background. Let me try to make this more concrete and talk about the types of things we funded. So this is our early portfolio, the first 43 awards we made to, to 41 innovations. There's a couple that got two awards. I'll just give you a sense of the range. You know, one of this was um, some students at the Sloan School at MIT who are, who are um, trying a, a for-profit company, sorry, a for-profit company that would provide sanitation services in slums in Kenya and sell the product for fertilizer and energy generation, et cetera. Another one was a ha household hand washing device. This was being done in Vietnam. This was a nonprofit, but was trying to produce a, you know, a, a gadget, a, a piece of hardware that would be used for um, for social needs. Uh, there, this was a, a, a mobile counting financial inclusion software, a bicycle tire that was uh, resistant to punctures, um, a, a e bike. This was, a, I, I'll highlight this, uh, voter report cards in India. This was not meant to scale commercially, uh, but it was a, a, a trying to provide information to, um, to voters about, um, about whether their, uh, their representatives were spend the funds that were allocated to them, et cetera. So what's our methodology for assessing whether the benefits are greater than the cost? And that's sort of the... Well, we'll determine is this worthwhile to invest in? Well, the benefits are the number of people reached times the net benefits per person. We wanted to include only the share of benefits corresponding to the share of information of investment. This, you know, a lot of funder sometimes innovations are supported by multiple funders. Um, everybody counts that as a, as a win. We want to to avoid double counting. So we we if if the IV provided. 10% of the funds, we sort of took 10% of the benefits. Obviously, it doesn't get at the counterfactual of what would have happened without DIB. Obviously, there are tons of difficulties estimating the benefits. There are conceptual issues. We have this program to reduce electoral, we funded something to reduce electoral fraud in Afghanistan. Um, how, do you, how do you value that? It's impossible to know. There are data limitations. Sometimes conceptually, you could uh, value something, but you just don't have the data. Um, it takes a long time for many innovations to scale. Some things, you know, Facebook, Google scale very rapidly, but there are many other examples that take decades and decades. So our approach, so it might seem this is an uh, insoluble ch a challenge. You know, what our approach was to take advantage of the fact that there's a very skewed distribution of innovation scale, and I'll show you that in a minute. And then compare the benefits of a subset of high scale innovations to the cost of the full portfolio. And then to try to use conservative assumptions throughout. Let me show you. Um, I mentioned there was a skewed distribution of innovation reach. More the, it's the bottom of my slide, maybe, okay, uh, being cut off here. But um, this shows the, um, of the 43, 43 grants to 41 uh, in, uh, innovations. Um, you'll see that the vast majority of them did not reach a million people. Now, nine of them reached a million people. I think that's actually very good relative to the sector as a whole, but still, that's not going to be the typical uh, award. That's obviously typical when you're funding innovation. If you're a venture capital firm, you know, you know that a, most of your, you hope that most of your returns are going to come from a few investments. A lot of your investments might not do that well, but if you funded Google or Facebook, you're going to come out doing just fine. So we see the same uh, very skewed distribution here. So I'll go through these in, in a little bit more detail, but the, the innovations in red, so we only tried to see if we could, uh, for, the only, for the innovations that reached over a million people, we tried to see, was it possible to quantify the benefits? Many of them 
you know, we really couldn't do that. The voter report cards being an example. But the ones in red, the five of these of these 41, uh, were things where we, we did try to come up with some estimate. Let me just give you a little bit more uh, sense of what things did scale. Software for community health workers. Um, this you know, India is a, is a big area where this is scaling. There's RCT evidence on this now. Um, it's, it's benefiting health along a number of dimensions. For example, the delivery of babies and facilities went up 17% when the community health workers have this software. The government of India, together with the Gates Foundation, is now scaling this up to India's 1 million health workers. Given the number of health workers that were reached uh, recently, I should say, by the way, this is, um, this is sort of the latest, this is work in progress, so please don't cite it yet. This is the, uh, um, the um, but I'm fairly confident in these numbers. This is sort of an update of, uh, of earlier work. Uh, um, so the pay, version of the paper on the web doesn't have these numbers yet. Um, the um, voter report cards, talked, uh, that's scaled up in, in India, but um, it's, um, it's um, we can't put a dollar value on that. Um, here's one where we could put a dollar value on, uh, which was glasses, uh, inexpensive glasses uh, for, for presbyopia. Um, come back to a, another election uh, monitoring approach, can't put a dollar value on it. Road safety stickers, we were able to quantify the health benefits. Um, mobile phone-based agricultural extension, um, uh, safe water, um, something, um, uh, let me mention the last one, this is psychometric credit assessment. Um, this is uh, something that was um, you know, used for people to help, basically the innovation was you get a questionnaire that's given to you on your phone, you answer certain questions, that's used to come up with some sort of psychometric credit score, and they sold the innovation to banks, which then you have now used this to, to make 1.5 billion in loans, um, 1.5 million people. So, um, but we, we couldn't find a way to put a dollar value on the benefits generated. Let me give you one example where we did put a dollar value. So this is the eyeglass example. Um, so DIV put in $430,000, know, very small relative uh, amounts of money. The, there's a RCT, a randomized controlled trial with tea pickers, showing that the productivity increased 22%. Now 6.8 million glasses have been distributed. We, we don't want to assume that the gain was 22% everywhere, but we're gonna assume half of that. It's a little bit arbitrary, but um, um, it seemed conservative. The share of an innovation investment put by DIV was 5%. That yields 31 million coming out of the $430,000 investment. And so we did this for the five uh, innovations. When you do that across the five innovations, and then the, um, the benefits that you get are $281 million. Now, what was the investment during this period? It was $16 million. So that means that just a lower bound, just the benefits of five out of these 41 uh, innovations was uh, 17 times the cost of the entire portfolio. I should say this bound is much higher than it was in, in, our, in our previous analysis done a little bit more than a year ago. This excludes many benefits. It excludes all future benefits. I, I, I think these innovations will continue to go. Some of them will probably expand a lot, like the community health worker uh, program, um, the software. It excludes some of the innovations with the highest reach and perhaps highest impact. Uh, it excludes all the innovations reaching less than a million people and excludes a bunch of externality benefits. So on the first question, isn't development innovation a good investment? I think the answer is, can't say for everything, but at least this is sort of proof of concept. It can have a very high, high benefit. So my sense, for example, you know, I, I have not studied it, but I think that the Tom Alnado program, I expect that's gonna have very high uh, benefits as well. But I've, I've not studied that. Um, the um, second question we ask is, which innovation scale? Now, we only, this is something where 
obviously scale is just is a necessary condition for large scale impact, but it's not it's not sufficient. Uh, uh, scaling a bad program doesn't help very much. Um, but we have more data on scale. There's obviously a lot of commercial innovations at scale. Um, you know, Uber um, um, and and or, you know, Facebook. Um, but there's concern over whether impact investing, social entrepreneurship, um, that's deliberately trying to create innovations to serve the poor, whether those innovations are scaling. There are a lot of examples of failures. And there's a great literature that tries to do subjective analysis. And, and they, the difficulty from my standpoint with that, or I think from an academic standpoint is, they often point to things which sound very sensible. You need to know your customer. You need a strong management team. But of course, ex post, when you know which ones have scaled, it's very easy to say, oh, yes, they obviously knew their customer or they've obviously had a strong management team. The question is, what factors that were determined at the beginning could you use to predict things? So we tried to uh, do that type of analysis. And we tried not just to look at the successes, but also at the failures and see you know, what was actually predictive. So first up is, you know, one saying in the, in the field is pilots never scale. There's a lot of cynicism about this. And you can see why if you looked at the, the 41 innovations, most of them didn't scale. So if we look at stage one, which is the pilots, in fact, only 17% of them went over a million. Stage two, 25%. Stage three, that's a sample size of one, uh, but it, it did scale. Okay. Um, this is a... Um, you now get a very different picture, however, when you look at the people reached per dollar, because those stage one innovations were much cheaper. They were $100,000. They are under 100,000. So if you look at the, and I don't wanna, I don't wanna play this up, these differences up too much, but you reached eight people for every dollar with the stage one innovations, same similarly with the stage two, and actually fewer with the stage three. I think the stage three was actually a very good investment made a lot of sense. Um, so I don't want to be negative on that. I don't want to argue these are statistically significant with the sample size of one but um, in, in stage three. But I think we should, I think the lesson to take from this is similar to the lesson from the, from the earlier part of the talk. You need to take a portf look portfolio wide. And um, if you invest in a portfolio of low cost things, you may get as much benefit as if you, even if a lot of them fail, as uh, just making bigger investments and in things that are further along. What about other award characteristics? Well, I told you we put a lot of emphasis on cost, and that turns out to be a big predictor. We look at whether the unit cost was less than $3, there's almost a 40% rate of scaling for those, you know, less than 10% if the cost is above $3. Linked to that, things that had a strategy of direct consumer sales, which is what I think the image that a lot of people have in mind of a, of a new entrepreneurial firm, that's, I don't want to claim that route never works, but it's very hard. The customer, if you're selling something very inexpensive, the customer acquisition costs are going to be very high relative to the profits that you can make. And that makes that a very hard business to be in. In contrast, there was a much higher rate of scaling uh, among things that, that were selling to intermediaries. Those intermediaries were typically either governments, as in the software sold to the government of India, um, or they were, um, they were being sold to businesses, existing large businesses. For example, the voter report cards, those were scaled up, an NGO produced them, they're sold to, they weren't sold, they were provided by free by the NGO, but newspapers publish them. They have many readers. Um, they like the free content. Um, here's another factor. You know, I think people often see researchers uh, as slowing things down, getting in the way. Um, you know, RCTs are seen as the gold standard, but there's a little bit of a backhanded compliment there because, you know, do we really need to go gold standard? Turns out that having an RCT was actually highly associated with, uh, with scaling. So it doesn't look like there's a conflict between doing RCTs and scaling, at least in this part of the market. And in fact, having economics researchers involved seemed to be a plus. Okay. Um, 
Well, you know, what could be going on here? And how can we explain this data? Because as I said, this, this sort of went against a lot of the conventional wisdom in the field that this approach would, uh, would work. Well, think about a model um, where investors have private information on, on maybe on both private and social returns. Uh, sorry, the innovators have that information. The investors, whether they're private sector or public sector, they have less information. And there are a lot of skilled, you know, highly skilled, highly motivated commercial investors out there. They're going to try to invest in the things that are actually commercially profitable. And public sector innovators or investors may be less nimble. You know, we had hardly any staff. Our staff were not paid a lot. Um, we had all sorts of government procurement rules to comply with. We couldn't just go talk to the to the uh, to the innovators. So that creates a risk that the public sector investors are going to suffer from a, a winner's curse. So, but yet I argued this was pretty successful. Well, why are there positive social returns to this public sector investment when we know all of the problems with public sector investment? Um, the hypothesis is that the commercial investors leave an arbitrage invest opportunity for socially motivated investors where there's low, at least ex ante, expected private returns, but high social returns. And then you can think about, try to think systematically, what types of innovations are going to have a low ratio of private to social returns? Those might be neglected by private sector investors. Well, first, you know, what do we know about this from industrial organization? Um, first, where there's low barriers to entry. There, it's harder for a private sector investor to make money. Is not what Warren Buffett calls a moat. Um, well, having a public published RCT makes it easier to replicate the innovation, which is desirable from a social standpoint, but not for profit-seeking investors. The second case is where realizing the returns requires a proprietary complementary asset. Then investing in the innovation doesn't look so good from a private sector investor perspective, because even if the the um, the invest and the the innovation succeeds. They have to partner with somebody who owns some some complementary asset, and they're going to demand the rents. So if you develop great software for community health workers, well, the government of India is going to get some of those rents. You're not going to be able to charge the government of India the full social surplus. To take another example, there were uh, there was a technology for reducing road vehicle accidents that was scaled up by partnering with the insurance large insurance companies. Those in large insurance companies, they were able to, you know, they didn't pay the full value of this uh, either. And finally, if there's just the consumer doesn't obtain the full value of the product, let's say a water treatment technology that reduces diarrhea, then it's going to be very hard to appropriate the full value as well. So you can think of this sort of four-way um, diagram. You know, private profitability on one side, social value on, a, on, the, on the vertical axis. There are lots of things that create a lot of private value and a lot of social value, whether that's, you know, BT, and maybe I'm making a value judgment here, but BT cotton or low-cost motorcycles or ride-hailing apps, you know, good for private investors, good for the world. Private sector is going to go after that. Then there's the, the, the we go uh, counterclockwise, you know, alcohol, cigarettes, there might be private money in it, but obviously a public investor doesn't want to go there. There's the negative territory where nobody wants to be. But then if you look at the lower right-hand uh, sector, you see some things there that might be profitable um, after some initial investment exposed, but weren't clearly profitable ex ante and therefore might not attract that much private investment, like the software for community health workers. There are also some things that are probably never going to be a big source of uh, of. Uh, of, uh, of private profits. So I think this area is an area that's going to be neglected by the private sector, but might be appropriate for the public sector. Okay. What are, what are some implications of a strategy of going for, the, for, for those areas? Well, you might design a process that's very different than the way a venture capital firm typically looks. And some of these things and I think the principle is what generates social value in excess of private value. So, for example, um, it was involved in a related effort with some venture capitalists. There was a question of do you provide feedback to rejected applicants? 
They thought, why would you do that? It takes resources. People are going to complain. You might get lawsuits. Well, from a you know, if you that's totally true from a private standpoint. From a social point of view, if you're doing peer review, giving that feedback to a rejected applicant could lead them, even if they don't, you don't give them money, that, that feedback could be very useful for them. Doing peer review, you know, if you're a private sector company, you know, you might do some peer review, but you have to worry. The idea might leak, maybe somebody else gets the gets the deal. Um, or maybe the information gets to a competitor for somebody that you fund. Well, if you're a public sector funding, that's great. You know, if we support our solar technology and that scales, we don't really care whether it was that company or another. Um, maybe I'm overstating a little bit. You know, researcher involvement, I've talked about support for early stage innovations. At an early stage, it's less clear that you're backing the company that's going to actually scale this, but you, you may still be advancing the, the innovation. Okay. Uh, openness across sectors, I think. You have to worry a little bit about a winner's curse if you're in in the in the private sector. Maybe you're getting the innovations that you know, if you're not a, if you're a top flight venture, venture capital firm, maybe you can find across sectors. If you're outside of there, you have to ask yourself, what you know, why are they coming to me? If I, why am I getting this deal? Maybe ten other venture capital firms have turned it down. You know, the way to solve that is to specialize in an area, and then you can really know the things coming in your area. That's important if there's all this competitive funding pressure um, for maybe private sector investors, maybe less important for a, a social investor. Okay, so what are the conclusion? Um, first, because the distribution of innovation reach is so skewed, you really can't go with anecdotes. You can't even go with counts. You know, the majority of things are not going to scale, but the overall return can be very high. So you need to think about this from a portfolio level approach. When we look at the example of development innovation ventures, it looks like there are very high returns to this. Obviously, we might have got lucky in those years. I, you know, there's some question about generalizability, but um, you know, and I'd love to try to apply, you know, work with others to apply this approach more broadly. But um, but it does look like there's potential in this area. Third point: innovation seem more likely to scale if there's low unit cost, if there's pre, if they have a scaling strategy that involves tapping into a pre-existing distribution network from the government or for existing large businesses. And it doesn't look like you know, RCTs and researcher involvement are negative. Um, you know, I think we're now at the stage in development economics um, where we should, th in other fields like biotech or or we think of researchers as adding value, and we don't think it's strange that you know, graduate students start a company. I think we're now in the place in development economics where we're, we're at a similar point, and, and researchers really can add value as innovators. Um, so the, um, I, I guess the final point is a, a methodological point. I think it would be helpful for other programs and funders to try to track results, and that way we can try to build up a, a better data but I think there's, um, you know, the, the, I guess where I take away from this, I think this is an exciting sector. And obviously, to go back to my original comments, traditional standard public innovation, public, sorry, private, and private sector innovation, public support for that um, is very important. But I also think there's a role for this type of investment, specifically in development innovation. And uh, you know, happy, to, uh, happy to take questions and talk about it. So, Mike, uh, I have a question. Um, you know, some of these issues you mentioned, for example, the benefits, the, ben the benefits are non-monetized. They are sort of social benefits. Uh, this kind of crops up in many contexts. And, you know, there is a general issue of uh, how, do you, how do you finance them? You know, for example, uh, you know, developing the railway line, the Q line, the subway line in New York, you know, a lot of the benefits are going to the subway travelers who are not in a position to uh, make use of the, I mean, they cannot pay for it. However, the real estate developers, the real estate people along the line, you know, they get a lot of, I mean, you know, they, their property prices went up, they got a lot of benefits. So in other words, 
is there a, when you talked about arbitrage you know is it part of the trick finding sort of uh, i mean it's a, it's a capturing the externality in the form of you know finding somebody else who is benefiting from it who can actually also partner in the investment yeah i think that's a i think that's a very interesting idea i'm thinking of the uh, the railways in the united states that were financed in part by grants of land to the uh, to the railway companies um um, you know, that obviously would no longer be, be feasible and probably wouldn't work in India. Yeah. <laughs> the politics. Um, but, uh, but I think it's, a, it's, an, it's an interesting idea. I do th also think that, however, that there can just be a role for where that's not feasible, just general public support may have, have a role. You obviously have to worry about that when you're talking about large amounts of money that you'll get wasteful expenditure. Um, you know, this was a, a, obviously a very modest program you saw from the dollar values involved. I think the, the railway, con the subway construction in New York is is obviously super, you know, it's expensive. It's yeah. A couple of billion dollars, is that right? Just for a very yeah. short uh, So, um, you know, we all know some of the dangers of public, uh, of public investment getting very costly and not necessarily being efficient. Uh, I don't want to make a statement on, on the New York subway, but... Uh, um, I, you know, I, I, by pointing to this example of success, I don't want to, uh, I, I actually, let me, let me say a little bit about a connection between that. Look, part of the reason the program was designed the way it was, there's a pretty tough screen in stage two. You need pretty rigorous evidence of impact and cost effectiveness before we put serious money in. This was hundred thousand dollars, a million dollars to do the testing. But if you want more than that, you really need this quite serious evidence. And I think that's part of why it was successful. I think this sector can be subject. Look, you know, this political economy factors. It's very easy to for politicians to get behind an idea that doesn't really make it, or not just politicians. You know, philanthropists as well can get behind an idea that doesn't really make that much sense and put a lot of money into it. But I think part of the structure of this puts some discipline on things to not really make that possible. We, we've really, the program's been around for 10 years. I think it's, um, you know, I think one of the things that's very important to the success of the program is, these, is the program design, which, which does limit, you know, you're, throw, you're missing, I, you, we probably miss some important, some good investments by having that strict criteria, but I think it's important to avoid getting into a pattern where you, you throw a lot of uh, money after bad, you know, mm -hmm. money after bad ideas. Other questions? Yeah, yeah. we have a question. Oh, Prof. Mishra, would you? Yeah, should I ask it? I put it in Q&A. Very simple question. You know, social stock exchanges are encouraging these NGOs and non-profit organizations to come up with innovations which will be probably cheap, provide people some cheap or free service or the product in the short run. So what the commercial players may do, they may introduce a bit more expensive innovation, get these cheaper innovations out of the market, and in the long run, offer their own product at a very expensive price. We see that happening in health and all that. How do you tackle that? You know, I think, I think we try to think about things not as a particular, because we're putting in public funding, we try to think not just is the particular innovation, is a particular company going to succeed, but is the innovation going to succeed? And we recognize that there's going to be development of that innovation over time. Nothing stays constant. The first version of an innovation, you know, is often not the one that scales. So we're okay with that because we're trying to maximize social returns rather than private returns. Um, I think if you're just going after private returns, you know, you don't want to back a company if some other company is going to is going to develop a product that's ultimately going to be more successful in the market. Thank you. But I think for philanthropists and for people with some social motivation, I think it's willing. It's if you're willing, if you're willing to accept that that will happen sometime then I think that you can create a lot of social value uh, by doing that. We have another question where uh, like hear about 
women participation as innovators. And, you know, we had a paper, uh, Professor, just before uh, your talk about how uh, participation of women, literacy of women contributes to uh, proper financial decision making. So the question is in that way. We'd like to hear about women participation as innovators. In continuation of the earlier talk, we see the gender gap is marginal in terms of economic literacy. Right. Um, you know, I think there are, um, let me, let me give a, um, one example of an innovation that I've been involved in, which I think has a, has, this is now going to something, you know, very particular. Um, it's not, um, but an innovation that I've been involved in, which I think has the potential to improve women's lives. This is, um, a financial innovation, a lending innovation for access to water. So obviously as, as, uh, you know, Esther Duflo's work with uh, Chato Padai um, shows you know, water is something that's really valued by by women because they often have responsibility for water collection. Um, this was, we worked in an area, and that was certainly also true in the area of Kenya where we work. This was something done in an area of Kenya where there's a lot of dairy farming. And obviously, you know, people need water, but dairy cattle also need a regular supply of water. People had to walk some distance to get water for themselves and for their cows. This was actually an area where there was plenty of rain during some parts of the year, but other times there wasn't. And most people had houses with uh, tin roof, with metal roofs. So you could actually get a water tank, a 5,000 liter you know, plastic water tank, and put it outside your house and put a gutter system on, and then um, and then just collect water, and you could get through most of the, certainly if you just had one or two cows in, a, in your household, you could get through most of the dry season with that. And the, um, but this cost about $300. Households, um, households couldn't, uh, couldn't really afford that without a loan. So we tried an, an approach where Households could, the, there was a dairy, the dairy had a savings uh, cooperative. The savings cooperative required um, required people to put up, you know, had very strong borrowing requirements, very strong collateral requirements, co-signing requirements. So we tried a program where the, um, the dairy cooperative would allow people to borrow with putting up the water, using the water tank itself as collateral. It's pretty good collateral. These tanks don't, you know, they last 10 years. They don't really depreciate. You can send a truck and repossess them. Um, and what we found was that there, the take up of these water tanks, which were really something that women wanted much more than men, that went from 2.4% to 44%. And there were hardly any, any uh, defaults. So a very, this really was something, this finance, this was a financial innovation. And it, it really led to a huge increase in access to this water technology, which you know, benefited the entire household, but probably primarily benefited uh, women. And in work with, um, with Tabneet Surrey and Yost Alad and Billy Jack, we, we found some evidence that this actually led to higher, uh, higher girls' uh, school enrollment, reduced dropout rates for girls. Um, so that's, that's one, I, you know, there are many examples, but that's, one thing that I've been involved in of an innovation that's you know, particularly valuable for women. Thank you. And you know, trying to do more, see if we can scale this up. Uh, we have another question. Um, so there's this rise investment or importance towards ESG. Would that foster positive impact on innovation with no social impact? I'm sorry, you said there's rising investment in, in what? Towards ESG. Oh, towards ESG. Yeah. I think it you know, I, I think it could, but I think it has to be structured appropriately. And that's partly why um, I think sometimes, well, that's a very broad category, and I don't want to, there's some categories where I probably can't say a lot. I think it would be great if within that general category, some things were de devoted towards this type of innovation. Um, and um, and I think that you know some of the things that I talked about will require some sacrifice, some private returns for social returns. But there are other things where um, 
you know, there may be some private return as well. Well, uh, um, Professor, I have a related question. You know, one of the uh, one of the things that the government uh, of India has been trying, and you would be aware of it, is uh, what's called Startup India. So it, this is an yeah. initiative to support innovation. So what we could get from your is a proper incentive structure has to be understood, and uh, there is need for proper data, proper analysis, maybe an RCT-based design before uh, one realizes uh, that not every innovation could be amenable for a private enterprise. You know, it, it, it makes right. sense to have to have this framework in place. How many governments that you've engaged with, or how many you know uh, agencies that you've engaged with, actually look at this framework? Uh, yeah, we did not find, I mean, one of the reasons, look, this paper started out as a little bit of a government report and it's gotten, you know, more academic over time, but I was not thrilled with the extent, with the, the literature on this. I think that there's, you know, there's, you tend to get, yeah, I, I think, I don't think the, the data that I've seen on the, on, on trying to analyze these types of programs is, leave something to be desired. So that's what, why one of the messages I concluded with is, I think it'd be good to see more of this type of analysis so we can learn how do you, what types of investments are more likely to succeed, what are less likely, is the return high in general, how should you structure these programs? And I think there's, it'd be great if more work were done along these lines, in my view. Thank you, Professor. Uh, let me just check if there are any further questions. There's a, uh, another generic question. How do you measure the long-term effectiveness of innovation? That's a great question. You know, the, the, I think if you look at um, a lot of innovations, they really take decades to reach their full potential. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why I really want to emphasize that the results right now should be seen as lower bounds. We're just including the value achieved to date. That's you know, eight to 10 years after the funding was, was conducted. I think it's quite possible that the big, you know, that the biggest benefits are going to be in the future. And I don't want to think this, you know, I think if we looked at, say, this uh, you know, community health worker uh, software, the, the, the number of people being reached by that is accelerating very rapidly. Um, so I think it's, I expect that these numbers are going to start looking better uh, each year that that that, uh, that we go on from here. I mean, you obviously can look historically at things that were funded thirty years ago or fifty years ago, but um, but you won't get quite as you know. There, there's some other questions like this one that you, you'd like to ask as well. You know, on a related note, I remember. Uh, 10, 10 years ago, traveling in China and seeing that, you know, their high-speed trains hardly had any people. You know, it's like it was right. not affordable for the ordinary people. Right. So, you know, I talked to many regulators at that time and their claim was, look, this is an investment for the long future, you know, they'll, and, and there'll, be, there'll be benefits social right. benefits at least coming from these and uh, you know that's that's right yeah and i should know that you know this type of methodology this is a lower bound on return yeah you know, let's say we've got a number not of 17 benefit to one cost ratio but we got zero point would i conclude this was a bad investment no because it's a lower bound maybe the benefits would come in the future yeah we have another question, Professor, uh, from uh, Joshua Zhang from Aberdeen University. Um, the question is, what's your view of uh, crowdfunding platforms in promoting innovation? Should you know, government policy, NGOs, promote crowdfunding platforms? Uh, that's a great question. Um, you know, I'm, I haven't studied those, so I don't have a, have a super strong view. I, I have heard some anecdotes which suggest they can be useful in some some cases, but I don't want to take a, a strong view. It seems like there's not a lot of not a lot of downside to them, but um, but you know maybe there are regulatory issues or other issues that um, I'm just not familiar enough. 
I had something scheduled at 930, which I'm uh, Chicago I'm a little bit late for, so I should I should probably go. I did try to get them a message. Let's do that. Mike, uh, I just want to uh, close by thanking you. That was fascinating. A uh, lot of wonderful, very interesting issues. Thank you so much. By the way, is it, do you have a completed paper on this? Or Yes, actually, there's something up, should be up on my website. I just moved to Chicago, so maybe it isn't, but it should also be up on the USA website. Those will Thank be you. some of lower numbers because they're from a year, that was done sort of a year and a half ago, but, uh, but the basic methodology is the same. So. And Mike, I have a related paper. I'm going to send that to you as well. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you very much. It. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, everyone. We had a very vibrant set of participants. I just want to say tomorrow, the highlight is going to be the panel discussion on the roadmap to the development of Indian bond markets, public bond markets, an outstanding panel. And then we also have two research papers very interesting research papers. The first one is on uh, financial stability and government guarantees. And the second one is on liquidity and fragility in the capital markets. So uh, those are the two papers and then a wonderful panel discussion. Thank you all. Uh, please join us tomorrow. Thank you.